היא לרפואת מרים בת אברהם, הן שחנז דבורה אלישבע בת שרה, להצלחת אביאלה בת שרה, רפואה ללאה בת גלה, ולעילוי נשמת אברהם בן אפרים. Today, Bezrat Hashem, I'm going to speak about Purim. As you know, Thursday it's a fast. Saturday night is the reading of the Megillah. So, you know, we have to we have to prepare the people before Purim. For the people that uh, send all every year the Matanot Laevionim, the donation for the poor, so they can use Maizel like last year. Mizrahi77 at yahoo.com or Venmo, Venmo it's Rabbi Mizrahi with no space. They can send it and just to write please Purim. Now we know it's not for Kiruv, it's to give it to the, to the poor guys in Yeshiva on the Purim day. So after this announcement, I still have one last Megillah left. If anyone wants to buy it, please also contact me, Rabbi gmail.com. It's less than half a price than in a store. Perfect Megillah opportunity. Someone asked me today, what do I need Megillah if I can read it from the Chumash, from the printed Chumash? So maybe I should start with explaining that. When you read the Megillah, you cannot miss one word. If you miss one word from Megillah, you did not fulfill your obligation. Since today our mind is not exactly sharp as it used to be, people thinking about other things, they look around, there's noise, kids make noise with the name Aman. You know, it's enough that you skip two or three words that uh, Chazan say, you're not Yotze Lidechova from the Chumash. When you have the Megillah, you can go back, read it, and then continue with the Chazan. Why? Because you have a kosher Megillah. It's not just like in a Sefer Torah. You cannot read from a, from a Chumash. You need to read from the actual parchment of the, of the Sefer Torah. Same thing with Megillah. This is the advantage of having Megillah. Also, sometimes you want to read for the women. You know, you want to read for the women after, after the davening. You know, so, you know. You cannot read for them from the regular Chumash. You need the actual Megillah to read. So this is uh, why we need to have the Megillah. For those who obviously can afford to buy Megillah, it's a good thing to have. As you know, in the Torah, we have different holidays in the Torah that Hashem gave us in Mount Sinai. And then there are a few holidays that the Chachamim made. As you know, in Parashat Shoftim, Hashem already told us that everything the Chachamim will tell us to do, we must listen to them. We're not allowed to move left or right from what they instruct us to do. And if someone will disrespect the Chachamim, the sages, what we call the rabbis, disrespect the Chachamim, and disobey their instructions, the Torah says clearly in Parashat Shoftim, in Deuteronomy, you should be put to death and you should clean the bed out of the nation. That's how bad it is. It's severe. It's not it's no joke. Today, unfortunately, there are so many ignorant people and when they want to decide if they want to listen to what Halakha say to do, first they check. Is it from Hashem? Or is it from Chazal, from the Chachamim? Ah, it's from Chazal, it's not so strict. The opposite. If it's from the Chachamim, you have two sins here. One is that you don't listen to the Chachamim. And second, that you go against Hashem. Because Hashem says you must listen to the Chachamim, otherwise you should be put to death. So if you not, you don't respect the Chachamim, <laughs> at least you respect Hashem. So if I'm the owner of a, of a company and I bring a guy to the office and I say from now on he's the manager here, whatever he says here, everybody must listen to him. Do not move left or right from his instructions. 
anyone who disobey him will have a problem with me. If someone disrespect the manager that I bought, he doesn't disrespect him. He does not respect me. He will understand the hard way what does it mean not to disobey the instruction of Hashem that say to listen to the Chachamim. Usually the Chachamim, they didn't make just laws. All the laws are coming directly from the Torah. But they made few decrees. Decrees. The decrees came in order for Judaism to reserve, to reserve some of the instructions of Hashem. For instance, when the Chachamim felt that the generation is starting to be weak about something, then the Chachamim made a takana, a decree, to help the generation not to fall. I'll give you an example. In the time of King David, until King David, for 300 years, everyone was modest. From Moshe Rabbeinu until King David, 300 years, nobody ever committed a sin with another woman, man and a woman, unless they were married first. So people were very modest. After 300 years, people started to shake a little bit. When King David and his bedding and his court saw that people are not as strong as they were until now, they made a decree. What's the decree? A single man and a single woman or a married woman cannot be isolated in a place that people have no access to, meaning they cannot lock the door, the bar, I mean the, the shades. And if the door is unlocked and it's open, or if it's a store front and people from the outside can see, it's no problem. If it's in a place that anyone can come in and out any second, it's no problem. It's like a guard. But if it's locked in a place with a key, nobody can enter in and nobody can see from the outside, that's already a sin. Closing and locking the door or not giving access to people, that's called Yichud. Why King David and his bed didn't made it? Because they wanted to make people far away from the actual sin. Before they begin to touch each other, they made them far away by, by making a law that you cannot isolate yourself in a place. Once you isolate yourself in a place, one thing leads to another. Okay. However, this is an example of a decree that comes to protect what the Torah say not to do. The Torah say forbidden relationship is obviously not allowed. And there is severe punishment. But if you see that the people are not so strict about it, then you have to make a fence around the fence that Hashem made. It's called Vasu Mishmeret Le Mishmarti. I made a Mishmeret, meaning I made a fence. Like a, it's like a bomb. There's a bomb, you made a fence around it, and you put a sign. Be careful, explosive. But you see, people are coming too close. So what do you do? You make another fence. Now there are two fences. The, the second one made you even far from the first one, meaning nobody will come too close to the bomb. This is the idea here. So the Chachamim, most of what they made is decrees to reserve the religion. For instance, they made a decree, you're not allowed to tell a Goy, a non-Jew, to do things for you on Shabbat. Why? Because then you're going to lose the holiness of Shabbat. People go to work, they take the Goy, Ahmed, come here, turn the lights on, open the gate, type on the cash register, collect the cash, do this, give the Goy instruction. Someone that is rich will have ten Goyim, Ahmed, Mustafa, Chris, you clean, you do this, you that, you cook for me, you that. Then obviously Shabbat will be a regular working day. People are greedy, they're going to start going to open. The goy will do the job until the goy will not be available. And then what's going to happen? The customer is going to wait and the Jews going to break Shabbat. So they already saw where it's going. They made a decree, you cannot tell the goyim to do work for you on Shabbat, unless it's for the sake of a sick person. They made an exclusion, meaning it's excluded this provision. And unless it's for the public who are busy with the mitzvah. The public needs to learn, and the lights went off, 
then you can bring the goy or the, or the air condition doesn't work and everyone is fainting from the heat or the other way around it's too cold and the heat doesn't work things like this that's when they use the goyim usually mainly today for sick people so this is an example of another decree but we have also few holidays that the Chachami made. If you can call all of them holidays, like Tisha B'Av, it's a morning day. You know, it comes every year on the ninth day of Av. We mourn the destruction of both temples. We have 17 of Tammuz, same thing. We have Asara B'Tevet, same thing. Days that we <laughs> memorized the destruction of our temples, the attack of the Goim on Jerusalem, the destruction that came right after that. Then holidays that, for instance, Tu Bishvat, Rosh Hashanah Le'ilanot, a day, not such a significant holiday, you take some fruit and you make brachot, but this is an example of one day, one day memorial events every year, but there are two official holidays that they made. The holidays the Chachamim made is not the same like the holidays of the Torah. When the Torah, Hashem gave an holiday, you're not allowed to, it's like Shabbat, you're not allowed to create, you know, to, to sew, to write, to drive a car, all these things you're not allowed. But the holidays the Chachamim made, you're allowed to create fire, you're allowed to drive a car, you're allowed to look at your phone. It's not, it's not in holiday just like in the Torah. It's different. So the two holidays that they made is Hanukkah and Purim. And they're, similar, they're close to each other. Hanukkah, right after that comes Purim. Hanukkah, it's eight days. You know the story, eight days. The Greeks wanted to destroy the Jewish nation spiritually. Spiritually, not, not physically. They wanted to destroy Judaism, to destroy Shabbat, to destroy Brit Milah, to destroy the rabbinical smicha, to destroy Rosh Chodesh, certain laws that if the Jews will not be able to keep, after one generation, they'll lose track on their religion. Why? The Jews, for the Greeks, it's like a pin in the neck. As long as these strange Jews following their strange laws dress different, speak different, worship an invisible God, believe in only one God, doing all kinds of things like Shabbat, like special holidays, like Lulav, Sukkah, a lot of strange things in the eyes of those wicked Greeks. As long as they are doing it, it makes our tradition, our Greek culture look like a joke because they were way before us. And they're very, very zealous about the religion all over the world. And all Jews were religious in those days, before the Greeks. So everyone who looks at the Greeks, no, it's not the real thing. They believe in many gods, all kinds of strange things. So the Greeks came up with an idea. We'll force the Jews to forget the religion. We'll turn them into Greeks like us. We are not coming to kill them. We don't want genocide. We just want to destroy the religion. Lechu v'nakhidem migoy, meaning we're not gonna, they're not going to be called the nation of Israel anymore. That was the story of the Greeks. We had a miracle after they, they made all the oil impure. We found a little barrel. The barrel was good for eight days. And that's the story of Hanukkah. We light the menorah to publish the miracle that Hashem made us. And a group of few hundred Jews religious fanatic Jews, Judah, the Maccabee, his brothers, the, ch the children of Matityahu, Kohen Gadol, and another few hundred of devoted Jews went into a war that technically there was no even theoretical chance to win against the Greek Empire, who occupied the whole world. Everyone was shaking from them. They were masters of war. They had all kinds of soldiers, trained soldiers, weapons, horses, uh, you know, anything you can think of against a group of Bachure Shiva, people who learn Torah. What are the odds? 
So the Greeks already knew in their mind, we're going to die. We die for Hashem. We die for, well, Kiddush Hashem. Hashem thought otherwise. He made an unbelievable miracle, perhaps the biggest in history. And that was the end of them. They kicked them out, and Baruch Hashem restored all the damage they made. This, is, this was a spiritual threat. Purim is different. There was one Haman, like Hitler exactly, and by the way, they are related, because Hitler is uh, from Amalek, from Germany, is from Amalek. And uh, it's the Gemara saying, Masechet Megillah, the Gemara says, Zo Germania shel Edom, shil male yotzim, achrivim kol haolam kulo. So the Gemara already said that there will be one day in a country named Germany and there will be the children of Edom. Who is Edom? Esav. Esav is Edom. And Esav is the grandfather of Amalek. Es Esav, his son, his name was Eliphaz. And Eliphaz had a son named Amalek. So Amalek is a grandson of Esav. So te technically, Esav and Yaakov are brothers. Yaakov is the father of the Jews. Esav is the father of the Nazis, or the Amalekim, or Haman, Haman Agagi. What does it mean, Haman Agagi? Haman from the, the son, from the, from the descendants of Agag. Agag was the king of Amalek. It's all written, the, all the genealogy. So Haman is from Amalek, and the Germans are from Amalek, even though not all Germans, not all Germans, some of them, Obviously, we do not know, but the Gemara said, this country named Germany, the Gemara in uh, almost 2,000 years ago, it's written in, in, in Masechet Megillah, page 6, the Gemara says that uh, there will be one day from Esav of Edom, there will be a country named Germany that will be created from 300 barbarian tribes. This was written in the Talmud before anyone heard the name Germany. No, there was no such country. And then if you go into the encyclopedia, you check about the history of Germany. There were 300 tribes. Each tribe was independent. They were all barbarians. They live among themselves. And then came one person named Bismarck, and he united all of them to the German Republic, the Republica of, of Germany and he turned them into one nation. But they still kept their independence financially, just like in the United States, you have many states, but the federal is above everything, right? But each state has their own rules, their own governor. As we can see now in Texas, they rebel against the federal. He doesn't want to listen to the president and his idiot ideas, the governor of Texas, why? They're not afraid of him. It's a big state. They have millions of people, Republicans, most of them. They are sick and tired of these stupid uh, the Democrats who destroy this country. So they decided they're going to do whatever they want, and they don't care what the president says. It's just to show you that they have their own independence. Same thing it was then. And then later, they turned it into one nation officially, which was Germany. There was East Germany and West Germany, and then after they knocked down the wall in Berlin, when communism collapsed, they had nothing else to offer communism. This idea went bankrupt. Communism means anti-God. We don't need God. We will take care of each other. But it was the most corrupted thing ever. You know, a bunch of uh, corrupted people stole the country, stole all the assets, kept the nation depressed, in the lowest possible level. And, uh, you know, eventually something like this cannot last forever. And what happened? Uh, communism collapsed and it became Germany. And this Germany was exactly made from 300 tribes. So Germany and Haman and Hitler and all of these people are all one. They all come from Amalek. And Amalek in a Torah is a very strange phenomenon. Usually when two nations fight, they always have a political reason. Two countries, like for instance, used, there was a war once between Argentina and England. UK went to a war against Argentina. Why? 
they had a fight about Falkland Island. Who really own it? They, they want the island. And they went to a war for that. Ego, money, whatever you want to call it. But there was a reason. Russia and Ukraine, all kinds of problems. The, what the, what's the name of that place that Russia occupied? Crimea. Crimea Island over there. And one thing leads to another. Up until now, it's already more than a year, a war, almost two years by now. Fighting for a reason. Something happened and that triggered the hatred between them. It can be China and Hong Kong. No matter where you look, there's always a war that comes down to a reason. Even the Arabs and the Jews. The Arab, Ishmael, Pere Adam. They hate the Jews. So no matter what, no matter where Jews are going to be, their mission is, they look at it as we must kill all Jews. That's how they look at it. This, by the way, way before Islam started. Some people think it started after Islam started. No, it was already before Islam. It's always the case. From the time Ishmael came to the world, the Gemara already say that Ishmael will always torture the children of Israel. That's it. That's a, it's a rule in a creation. But Amalek technically have nothing to do with us. We don't have a mutual border. We're not close to each other. We never attack them. And no matter what, they always like to come find us, no matter where we are, surprise us, and come to try to fight us and kill us, knowing they're going to die. They're going to die, but they don't care. As long as we attack them, we're happy. This is Amalek. You know, first time Amalek came was when we came out of Egypt. When we came out of Egypt, immediately Amalek showed up. Now I want to ask you a question. Are they really that stupid? The whole world just saw what Hashem did to the Egyptians for one year in Egypt. Destroyed the biggest empire in the world. They saw Dam, Tzfardea, Kinim, Arov, all the ten plagues. Probably a million Egyptians died in Makat Bechorot. So the question is, Amalek saw all of that. What was on their mind? They are not as strong as the Egyptians. If Hashem wiped out the Egyptians and destroyed their country, Amalek should have been very scared to start a war against us. Why will they show up from far away, waiting for us right when we come out of Egypt for a war? The answer is, <coughs> we have to go back to the root of the conflict. Two brothers were born to Rivka, Rebecca, the wife of, uh, of, of Yitzhak Avinu. As you know, she had twins. They fight inside already the womb. She goes to the yeshiva of Shem Vaever. She asks what to do. They tell her over there, don't worry, you don't have a modern orthodox faker. <laughs> that one day is religious, the next day is a goy. No. You have two different kids. One is tzaddik, one is rasha. One is righteous, one is wicked. She had a relief. From here we learn, God forbid, if you need to have one kid that is half religious, half goy, is worse than to have one kid righteous and one kid wicked. Even though to have a wicked kid, the Gemara said that it's like equal to milchemet gogu magog. When a person has a wicked child, like recently we saw all kinds of wicked people going online, having all kinds of podcasts, challenging the Torah, challenging their parents, Hashem irachem. Azei panim chatsufim, worse than the face of a dog. Pnei ador ke pnei akelev. We saw all these reshaim recently popping up. Vayatsitsu kol poale aven li shamdam adead. Moment before Hashem will wipe them out for eternity, they bark a lot. They make a lot of noise. So what happened? So the Gemara says, if someone has such a child, is worse than Milchemet Gogu Magog. Gogu Magog, two-thirds of the people in the world will die. More than five billion people. Can you imagine a bigger tragedy than that? 
in a world war, there were 50 million dead. 50 million all together with the Jews, with the Goim that died. 50 million people and the world was shocked. The, the Second World War. That's a joke compared to what's coming. Two thirds of the people in the world will die in 12 minutes. That means more than 5 billion people, not 50 million, 5 billion in 12 minutes. That means the world will come to an end, officially. And then Hashem will, you know, there will be the salvation, the Messiah, the resurrection of the dead. So, uh, such a tragedy. And the Gemara compare one child that became wicked, just like Gog and Magog. What does it mean for the father? For the father, if you ask him, what would you prefer now? To be a victim of Gog and Magog? To be one of the people that would die and not survive? But your son will be tzaddik? Or to survive Gog and Magog, but your son will become Rasha Merusha? A normal father, what would he say? Take me, and at least my son will be a tzaddik, ben Torah. I'm willing to sacrifice myself to save his neshama. After all, <laughs> that's my responsibility, right? So even though it's such a horrible thing, such a sensitive comparison that Chachami made between one kid that goes off the derech to Milchemet Gog and Magog, is not as bad as having a faker, half religious, half secular. Keeping Shabbat and Motzei Shabbat go to the theater to watch some Hollywood movie with naked people. Using all kinds of American curses. Selling watches on Facebook with his tzitzit out and his fat Rolex and every other word is a curse. Someone told me, you know, you should tell, the, should tell this watch dealer that sell on Facebook, should take off their kippah. So why? So look how they talk. It's the biggest chilul Hashem. Who needs to know that they're Jewish? They look like goyim anyway. Tell them to hide the tzitzit, take off their kippah, and that, at least they don't embarrass the reputation of the religious Jews. Because they're not really religious. They think they are, but they're not. So they pretend to be, but then they make a huge damage because I wonder the goyim that watch them, I don't know exactly how you sell on Facebook. What do they do? They have a show there, I don't know exactly what they do. Probably they present their merchandise. What normal person would care if you want to be a salesperson? Forget about religion. A goy, non-Jew. You want to sell merchandise. Are you really that stupid that you, should, you don't know that you have to keep your mouth clean? to make good impression on the customers. Not every customer is a low life that can tolerate your curses. I guess these people, I don't know, maybe they're drug addicts, maybe they're drunk, I don't know what's in their mind. Or maybe they're just a bunch of low lives, one of the three. One way or the other, the Gemara said that a faker is more dangerous than a complete wicked. Complete wicked, you know, you have zero expectation from him. That's why you are not as disappointed. If he doesn't show up on Shabbat to Shul, you're not surprised, you know he won't come. You beg him to come, you know, to do as a mitzvah, you know he won't come. The other one that is a faker, you don't know what to expect. So if he doesn't come, it disappoints you. Again, and again, and again, and again. This is what Yanai said to his wife. You don't have to be careful from the ultra-Orthodox righteous people. They will not fail you. And you don't have to be the, careful from the total wicked people. You know exactly not to expect anything from them. You should be careful from those who are half enough. They are the most dangerous one. And you can see even in Israel, some of them sit in the government. They have kippah and tzitzit and beards. And their ideology is almost like Haman. They hate Bachure Shivot. When the secular people call to send the Bachure Shivot to the army, they stand and they say, it's about time we should go to the army. They speak like Goim, with their Yamaka and beer. Many of them are very, very strict in Zionism. Zionim, Zionim, what is it Zionim? Zionim are spiritual Nazis. They are physical Nazis, 
like the Germans or Haman who wants to kill bodies. And there are Tzionim. Tzionim wanted to destroy the Torah of Hashem, to destroy the Yeshivot, to destroy the religion, to destroy Shabbat, to destroy everything religious. What is it, Zionim? They came from Russia and Poland. They have communist ideology. They, they were very impressed by all these communist authors in Russia, by their music, by their books, the communist revolution in Russia. And they wanted to turn Israel to a small Russia. Later, they wanted to make it like Paris or London or New York, a country of non-Jews. A lot of these people that still have yarmulke on their head admire them. It's hard to believe. Even Herzl, in Machshimo, his picture is still in the Knesset. His, his plan was to destroy the whole Jewish nation, to turn us all to Catholic. He wrote a letter to the Pope, give me some time, I will turn all the Jews to become Christian. It's written in his book. He's not even hiding it. In his book, it's written that that was his plan. And this Tzioinim with Yamaka still admire him. Even today, after they heard a thousand times that his plan was to turn all of us to Catholic Christians, they still admire him. Unbelievable. It's hard to believe, how can it be? They have one rabbi, I don't want to say his name, he knows a lot of Torah, a lot of Torah. You can ask him any question you want. It's Talmid Chacham, you see. He learned many years Torah. You don't, you don't reach that level unless you learn at least 30 years. At least, from morning to night. Then somebody asks him about Herzl and he begins to praise him. <laughs> How can you rely on such a person? You praise him? It's like praising Antiochus. <laughs> what's, what's wrong with you? How can you praise Mechalel Shabbat, who refused to circumcise his son, called him Hans, lit Christmas tree in his house, and wanted to turn the entire Jewish nation to become Christians? How can you even look at his face? See, when you have an ignorant Jew that admire these clowns, I have zero expectation from them. What did I know from their life? But when you see someone tzioni like this, that is blinded by this nonsense, the poison of this communist tzioni, you begin to understand the words of Chazal and Gedolei Israel, how much they were hating them, how much they didn't want anything to do with them. There are videos how they cut the peot of the Yemenites when they arrived to Israel, they stood right there, forced them to cut off their peot, forced them to work on Shabbat, they told them the Messiah already came. You don't need to keep Shabbat. The Yemenites were very naive, you know. They came from a very primitive culture. Obviously, in those days, there were no media, no, they didn't even have radio. They come from Yemen, the most primitive country, like Sudan, like those countries. They didn't know anything besides learning and praying. What did they know? They had donkey in the backyard. They used to grind the wheat with the stone, the old-fashioned way. None of them had any electronic device or electric device. In Yemen, they used to walk with a, with a donkey. I remember my father had a Yemenite friend, Alava Shalom. Yefet was his name, Yefet. It's a common name by the, by the Temanim, Yefet. And I remember when my father took me as a child to Yefet's parents in Shkunat Atikva. Many Yemenites used to live there in those days. Today it's all Sudanese, Eritrea, Chinese. Already different country. Back then, you had the Persians, you had the Iraqis, and many Temanim, many Yemenites. And uh, I, I remember I used to go there. Why I wanted to go with my father every time? Because they had a donkey. Kids see a donkey, they're getting excited. I remember clearly how I used to go see these two old Yemenites in their 80s. Of course, the woman is covered from head to toe. And uh, the father was with the Tehillim and the Nargila. I think the Yemenite invented this Nargila. Like this, I remember how the smoke comes out of his nostrils. Well, all day, Tehillim, that's how they talk. 
you know, they have a lemon tree, pepper, you know, hot pepper, and the donkey is connected to two round stones. The donkey goes around, and two stones grind each other, you put between the stones what you want to grind, and that's how they used to be. <laughs> Even when they came to Israel. They took people like this that were attached to Hashem, to religion, that were modest, that were down to earth, you know, such holy people. Remember, in Yemen, you never had one Jew that was not Shomer Shabbat in a history until today, 2,600 years. You never had a Jew Mechalel Shabbat in Yemen, never. Why people became in Mechalele Shabbat in every other country? Modern lifestyle. The culture of the Goim penetrated to their communities. But in Yemen, there was all Muslims. They were also covered. They are in religion, the Jews in their corner. Very primitive place. No electronic, no electric, no television. <laughs> Nothing can influence you. That's it. You have school, you go to the Mori, you learn Gemara all day. You come home, there's no electric, you live in some shed. And you, all you have is a shame in your life. Today, the kids have so many options, that's what's destroyed almost all of them. Look what's going on today. So, they took this temanim, they cut their peot, they stole their children. They saw a family with nine kids. They gave birth to the ninth child. They told her, hey, Margalit, we're very sorry. Your, your child just died in, you know, an hour after she gave birth. Where is my baby? I want to feed him. We're very sorry he died. They stole the kids. Some of them they gave to Ashkenazi couples who couldn't have kids. They gave them a gift. Here, take a child. This is this Tzionim. This Tzionim, this, this, these are the people who kidnapped Israel from the religious people. Because remember, whoever made Israel, whoever came back to Israel and revived the Holy Land were all religious people in 1880 to 1882. Those two years where all the Chovevet Tzion came to Israel and turned it into a Jewish place. They, they dried the swamps, they planted eucalyptus tree, eucalyptus tree, he drank all the swamps, all the malaria, all the mosquitoes, it's all gone. They hired the Arabs who were there, they didn't know what to do with the land, the few Arabs that were living there. They hired them to work in a farm, and they, started, and they built more than 30 cities. Petah Tikva, Rishon Lezion, Rosh Pinat, Ganya, all these cities. They built more than 30 cities, the religious people. And then 30 years later, 1917, 35 years later, all these communist reshaim, imach shimam, one by one, all these spiritual Nazis, spiritual Nazis, they arrived to Israel in massive amounts. And they kidnapped the country from the religious people who lived there. They kidnapped because they became the majority. And from then on until today, they didn't stop for a second to force the secular rotten mentality on the religious Jews that lived in Israel. They basically kidnapped the country. They turned Israel into Russia. Kibbutzim, Moshavim, you need a red card. If you want to get a job, you have to be one, a member of the union. You cannot be a member of the union unless you commit to work on Shabbat. You don't want to work on Shabbat? Starve to death. We don't care. But I'm religious. Somebody ever ask you who made Israel what it is today? The answer is the Ashkenazi Hasidim that came from Europe with 5,000 religious Yemenites who came from Yemen between 1880 to 1882. Without them, Jews would not be in the land of Israel. It's a good thing or bad thing, depending on who you ask. If you ask the Rav Yoel Misatmer, it's a disaster that they decided to go to Israel and revive it. According to them, and according to Gemara, they should have waited for the Mashiach to gather us into Israel. It wasn't supposed to be in a war, fighting with the nations, with the Goim, needing the approval of the United Nations after the Holocaust. That wasn't the way it was supposed to be, according to the prophecies. 
So, if you ask other people, no, of course, we should have done it. It was an opportunity to go back to the Holy Land. Okay. One way or the other to conclude, so these Tzioinim, they kidnap, I don't know how many, thousands or hundreds of Yemenite kids. Today, a few years ago, after Shimon Peres died, they found out that he was the one behind it. And the reason why they were kidnapping the Yemenite kids, because they gave them to United States. Because in United States, they used to make uh, all kinds of experiments on black kids. Blacks in those days didn't have rights. 90 years ago, 100 years ago. They were not like what they are today. In America, it was very difficult to be black in those days. So they, they made all kinds of experiments on black kids until the media here started to make noise. What is this? You're doing all kinds of experiments on black kids. It became a lot of noise here. They realized they cannot continue what they are doing. They needed kids. So Shimon Perez told them, I will give you kids, but in one condition. What's the condition? You will convince the French government to build a nuclear facility in Dimona. You will tell them that we needed for uh, civil reasons, not for nuclear bombs. We need, we need uh, power. The nuclear has much more power than regular electric. It can make the whole country run. We need it for, you know, for civil reasons, not for uh, army reasons. And the United States made a deal with him, and they convinced the French government to send their engineers for a few years in Israel. They were building the Kur in Dimona, the one that you see today. Until the last week, the French naive people and government, they really believe that Israel needs this nuclear for electric. Only when it was too late, they found out that there was a scam to begin with, that the Israeli never needed it for electric reason. They needed it to create nuclear bombs to threat the anti-Semite world that they never be able to attack Israel. This is, this, this is how they believe. Once we're going to have nuclear bombs, no one will mess with us. So that's exactly what happened. Then the French were furious when they found out. They went crazy. But it was too late for them. In the meantime, thousands of Yemenites, or I don't know the number, that's why I'm careful. It could be hundreds, could be thousands. They were, you can say, sold to America for that uh, reason. If you would ask Shimon Peres what you did was good or not, he will give you a reason. He said, listen, my, my goal was that Israel will have nuclear facility. Why? Because without it, how, what kind of a future we have surrounded by so many Arab Nazis who wants to murder us every second? What will prevent them from doing what they want to do? The, the answer is only nuclear facility. So it, it, this is a little bit from the history. So now, remember, we cry about Iran, we cry about the Nazis, we cry about Russia, we cry about the Arabs. In reality, the ones that made Israel the biggest damage and destroyed us from inside were all these Zionim, these Zionist, communist, wicked, anti-God people who came to Israel in 1917, kidnapped the country from the religious Orthodox people, Ashkenazim and Yemenites that were there and made Israel a state of going until today. Look, 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 you go to Israel. Do you feel anything religious there? In some areas, Yerushalayim, Bnei Brak, yeah. There are some areas where the religious people live, but the control over there is 100% like going. They promote abomination. They promote horrible things against the Torah every second. And this is what we're living with since 1917 until today, more than 100 years of spiritual destruction, just like the Greeks. But this time is for those who consider to be Jews. Now, there's nothing Jewish about them. 
but they are considered Jews. Supposedly their mother are Jewish. But that's Hanukkah. Now Purim is a whole different story. This is Amalek. Why Amalek always is looking to destroy us physically, to kill us? That's the story of Purim. We have to go back to the root of the problem. What is the root of the problem? Yaakov and Esav came from the same mother. One day Esav comes, he's hungry, you see Yaakov is making a lentil soup, red one. That's why his name is Edom. Edom comes from Adom. Adom means red. He said, give me, give me some. He said, ah, sell me your Bechora. I want to be the firstborn. Why? When you have twins, who is really the firstborn? The one that comes out first or the one that comes out second? Technically, the one that comes first, they put a sign on him, right? Because he's identical twins. They don't want to make mistakes. Babies look exactly alike. <laughs> we can get confused between them. So they must put a mark. And they mark him, that's the Bechor. But who cr was created first, the Gemara say, the one that is inside. I'll tell you what it's like. When you want to get your suitcase fast from El Al, or from any other airline, you want to be one of the first one to check in, or one of the last one to check in? The, the, fair, the latest that you come, the faster you get your suitcase. Why? Those who come three hours before the flight, they push their suitcase all the way in. Because they are the first one to arrive. So the first one is going in the back. Those who come late, half an hour before, their suitcase is almost in the end. Mamash a second before getting it out. When it arrives, they begin from the end to the beginning. Those who came later get their suitcases fast. Same thing with twins. The one that was created first is pushed inside the womb. The one that was created second is outside. When the mother gives birth, who comes first? The youngest. He's a little bit younger. But according to the halacha, he's considered the firstborn. Yaakov told him, I was created before you anyway. <laughs> and anyway, you don't care about the tradition of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our family. You're a hunter. You know, nothing about you is holy. What do you need, Olam Abba? You don't believe in it anyway. Sell it to me. He sold it to him for a lentil soup and a piece of bread. That's it. This stupid Esav later, later realized what he had done. And, uh, and that's how the hatred between Esav and Yaakov started. It really started before they were born, as you can see. Then Rivka went to Shem, he said, you have two, two nations inside your stomach. Two nations inside your stomach. And by the way, when they were born, Esav wanted to kill Yaakov for 34 years. Yaakov was hiding from him. 34 years. Until he finally came with 400 men to kill him. Then when he came, in the end he didn't kill him. You know the story. But then he said to his son Eliphaz, I'm counting on you to finish the job. When Eliphaz came to kill uh, Yaakov, Yaakov said to him, I'm your rabbi. I taught you everything you know. You want to kill your rabbi? He said, no, of course I don't. But my father told me I have to kill you. So he told him, take everything I have. If you clean a person from all his money, it's count like you kill him. Ani chashuv kemet. He cannot do anything. He cannot buy anything. He cannot buy tefillin. He cannot buy mezuzot. He has basically nothing to do. He cannot even practice the religion. Consider like a dead person. Take away everything I have. Plus, tell your father that it's not worth it for you to kill me. Because our grandfather Abraham already had a curse from Hashem that his grandchildren will be slave in another country. If you kill me, you're going to be the slave. You are going to be the only survivor from, from, from Abraham. Abraham, Yitzchak, 
and you. If you leave us alive, we will be the one who goes to Egypt. Because after the slavery it's written that we're going to come out with lots of wealth and we're going to receive the Torah and going to the Holy Land. That's the plan. But we're going to suffer in Egypt for a long time. You want to take our place? You want to be slaves in Egypt for so, so many generations? Ask your father if he agreed to such thing. So Asaph said, it's a good point. I have to wait until I kill him because it's not going to work it for us. We're going to have to go to Egypt instead. But you, Eliphaz, when they come out of Egypt, immediately you run to attack them. Don't wait another minute. And Eliphaz is Amalek. His son is Amalek. So that's why when a Jewish nation came out of Egypt, who showed up? Amalek to attack them. What are you, normal? You didn't see what God did to the Egyptians that messed with them? The Egyptians are a hundred times stronger than you. If Hashem wiped them out, what, what makes you think that you're going to do it? Amalek, there is one thing about them, the Torah say. They know they're going to die. But as long as they get us colder, it's worth it for them. Rashi writes, what is it like? There is a bubbling pool, pool with very boiling water, very hot water. Someone wants to cool the water, so what does he do? He jumps into the water. He screams, it burns him. But because he jumped with a cold body into the water, now the water temperature just dropped 10, 15 degrees. He made it colder, but he's, he's all burned, doesn't matter. As long as I make the bat colder, it was worth it for me. Rashi used this analogy on, on Amalek. Every time the Jewish nation is on the way up, who shows up? Amalek. Now who is Amalek? The grandfather of Agag. Agag is the king of Amalek. Who is the grandson of Agag? Haman. Haman Agagi. Now when we got the whole picture, now we can start talking about Purim. The decree of Purim was not to kill the religion. Yes, of course, Haman hated the religion, obviously. But it's for him, it doesn't matter. He wants to kill all Jews. We can argue that because in that time there were no, there were no secular Jews at all. At all. Now, you couldn't find one Jew in the world that was not religious. How do you know it? From the way Haman presents the case to Achashverosh. It's a strange nation, the religion is different, they dress different, their language is different than us. They are scattered all over. They are nothing like us. If the Jews look like the Jews today, Achashverosh would say, who are you talking about? He said to him, the Jews. So what difference between us and the Jews? We eat pork, they eat pork. We went to Harvard, they went to Harvard. We cares, they cares. Whatever we do, they do. Well, I don't see a difference between us and them. Hussein Obama would say, Can find me one difference between me and Bernie Sanders. <laughs> we could have been brothers if I wouldn't be black. Me and Bernie Sanders, same ideology. Same thoughts, same ideology, same wickedness, same everything. What's the difference? Chuck Schumer. Chuck Schumer is any different than any one of these goyim here in America? No difference. Any antisemite here, same story. So today the Jews of America, they don't represent the way the Torah is. So anyone who come to the king, they want to kill the Jews, he would not be able to say they are strange, they are different. <laughs> if you come and say, I want to kill Hasidim, oh. Hasidim looks different, they dress different, they speak different language. You can make a case. But if you come and say to the king, I want to kill all Jews, the king will tell you 80% of them look exactly like us. Same names, same accent, same universities, same food, same everything, and we even marry together. 75% of them marry us. We all families. What do you want? Trump, some of his kids married to, to non-Jews. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Biden. Some of his kids married to Jews. Uh, Bernie Sanders. All his, all his kids are married to Goim. 
So everyone you look around here is all assimilated. Do you get the point? But Haman comes to Achashverosh and says they're all, all of them are strange, all of them are different, all of them. Now we're going to get the entire story with all the secrets behind the scene. The story of Purim, when does it start really? Do you know the right order of the empires? Well, we have Egypt. This was 3,400 years ago, 3,400 years ago. Egypt, Paro. After Egypt, you had the Philistines, Plishtim, in the time of Shimshon. Philistines, almost 3,000 years ago. Then after that, who came into power? Babel, Babylon, where Iraq is. They became the biggest empire in the world. Started to occupy the world, the Imperia Bavlit. They destroyed the first temple. The temple that King Solomon built was standing 410 years. The Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, and his minister, Nebuchadnezzar, murdered 20 million people. It was very difficult to murder 20 million people 2,600 years ago. There was no bombs, no guns. <laughs> you had to kill them one by one with, with sword and spears. And uh, do you know how long it took to kill 20 million people? It's a very, very difficult job. It's not like today you can gas people, 20,000 died in a second. It's a different world back then. But still, they killed 20 million people. And they destroyed the temple. Seven years after they destroyed the temple, we rebuilt the temple. Who gave us permission to go and build the temple? We were not living in the Holy Land. Koresh, the king of Persia. Soon we're going to understand who's the, who this Koresh is, why all of a sudden he gave us permission. The story of Purim starts in the end of the 70 years between the first temple to the beginning of the, of the creation of the second temple. Remember, the Babylonians destroyed the first temple. Now, seven years, we don't have Bet Mikdash. We don't have the temple in Jerusalem. It's destroyed. What's left from the first temple? Only the western wall, standing. Seven years passed, the Babylonian Empire started to lose their power, and who took control? The Persians. Parasu Madai. After, uh, there was a king named Darius, Daryavesh, Darius. And then came Kuresh. And Koresh, right away, gave permission to Ezra and Nehemiah to gather some Jews to go to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. It was a good king to the Jews. And he also said that he's gonna pay, sponsor the work. Not only gave them permission to go build, he's also going to sponsor the job. So, they, the Jews started to collect uh, people. They went to Eretz Israel and started to build the second temple. Now, who comes to take the place of Koresh? Koresh died, and King Ahasuerus is taking over. Right away, he gives an order to cancel the permission and the sponsorship that King Koresh gave to the Jews to build the temple. Remember, the Jews already went to Jerusalem, but he's in charge. Just like Sleepy Joe took over uh, by, uh, Trump, first thing he did, started to cancel every one of his orders. Stop building the wall, stop uh, telling Muslims not to come into America, bring millions of them, we need them here to kill us fast, let them in give immigration to everyone, uh, any student terrorist who wants to come, let him in. 
A lot of the rules that Trump made were very good for the country. As much as you can hate him, at least his decisions were correct. But of course, the Democrats, everything that God hates, they love. And they had to destroy this country even more than it already was destroyed. And all the laws that uh, Trump made, they cancel basically everything, almost everything. What do you think would happen if Trump will get elected now? Same story. We'll cancel all the decrees they made, all the, whatever they did, he will cancel everything. At that time, who was uh, the right hand man of Achashverosh? Haman. Haman started as a barber. Probably the only Bukharian, the, the only barber that was not Bukharian. Oh, Hashem, Bukharian are very talented. They took over all the barber shops. Very good barbers. So sometimes my son's friends come with the haircut. They talk about the haircut, you know, teenagers. I say, I can only promise you one thing. What? That your barber, your barber was Bukharian. How do you know? <laughs> Baruch Hashem, they had monopole. But in time of Amman, there were no Bukharians yet. There were only Persian Jews. Bukharians are Persians who went to Bukhara, to the Kafkaz. And they were there for about 150 years. They found jobs there. And little by little, they got mixed with the Kafkazi over there. The language started to change a little bit, but it's similar to Farsi. Also Kafkazim, they have very similar language to Farsi. Food is very similar, the rice, all the, the culture very similar. So, Amman was, he started as a barber, then he became so rich that he was even wealthier than the king. That's how, how, how rich he became. How many kids he had? How many kids he had? 208 kids. 200, more than Bin Laden. Bin Laden, I think, had 120. I know some women are about to faint. Don't worry, it wasn't from one wife. <laughs> Probably had many wives. So I want to ask you, if that's the case, that he had 208 Nazi kids, he's the, the head of the Nazi, Amman. Amman, Amman Agagi. Why they only hung 10 sons? Not, why didn't kill all 208? The answer is, because only 10 of them were activists in politics. The other, as much as they hated the Jews, they were not making a direct damage. Everyone was minding his own business. But those 10 promoting hate, instigating. Like today, you have this kind of goyim, Nazis, that promote antisemitism. How do we know it? It's written in the book of Ezra. Who is Ezra? Our leader in that time. He is the one who got permission from Koresh to go to build Bet HaMikdash. Why his name is Ezra Sofer? Why they call him Ezra Sofer? Sofer has two different meanings. Sofer can be Sofer Stam, writes Tfilin, Mezuzot, Sefer Torah. Sofer also means counting. Sofer, chad, shtayim, shalosh, one, two, three, that's called counting, sofer. Which one of the two they refer to when they say Ezra sofer? The one that is able to count. To count what? Any name you tell him in a parasha, he'll tell you right away how many times it appears. Avraham, 35 times. Avimelech, 21 times. Sarah, seven times. He knows right away. Every word in the Torah, you tell him how many times the word paro appears in the Torah. Why the way it tells you how many times? Unbelievable brain yet. And holiness. So, in the book of Ezra, it's written that those ten were teaching very negative things about the, about the nation of Israel, to the Goim. And they are the one who stopped the construction in the second temple. As they were building it, they convinced Achashverosh to stop the permission that the previous king, Koresh, gave the Jews to build the temple, to stop everything immediately. 
אחשוורוש, it wasn't uh, from a genealogy of kings. You know, in those days, in order for you to be a king, you have to be a son of a king, or a grandson of a king. If not, why would you become a king? So Achashverosh, his father wasn't a king, his grandfather wasn't a king. How he was able to take the kingdom, but not just the kingdom, he became a king of 127 countries. 127. Do you know the globe? Where is India? The continent of India, right? And Africa, how close they are to each other. Meodu ve'at kush. Africa and India, are they close? How long does it take to fly from India to Africa? Seven hours. Huh? Seven hours. Seven Check. 127 countries all the way from India to Africa Everyone were under the kingdom of Achashverosh, and they all paid him taxes. Imagine this. So, Achashverosh knew that he has no chance to be a king. That's why he took Vashti to become his wife. Who was Vashti? She was from the royal family. She was the daughter of Balshatsar. The son of Evil Merudach, the son of Nebuchadnezzar. So she's a fourth generation from the king of Babylon. This Nazi Nebuchadnezzar who destroyed the first temple. Her grand grandfather is the one who destroyed the first temple that King Solomon built. He had a son, Evil Merudach, king. This Evil had a, a, a son. Uh, Balshatsar and Balshatsar had a daughter named Vashti. So Achashverosh married Vashti, like this nobody gave him any hard time on the way to become a king. Now the whole story that we read in Megillat Esther, from the beginning to the end, how many years it took? You read from the beginning until the end of the Megillah. It takes about 40, 45 minutes to read it. These 45 minutes that you spend on the night of Purim and the morning, the following morning, how many years is that? The answer, nine years. Nine years. The whole story of the Megillah, it took nine years. Everybody knew that the exile after the destruction of the first temple will be 70 years. They knew in advance, based on the words of the prophets. So the prophet Jeremiah, Irmia, he already told them once the first temple was destroyed, from that moment it will take 70 years to be in exile. 70 years. Also, the Goim knew about it. Balshatsar, the king of ba Babylon, he also knew that these 70 years, that the, after we destroyed the temple, you know, my grandfather Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the Jewish temple, they knew, the Goim, that this situation would last 70 years. They knew it. Why? Based on the word of the Jewish prophet. The Goim knew the power of the prophets. So what was their mistake? Their mistake was in two years, in a calculation. In the meantime, this Balshatsar, he saw that seven years passed according to his calculation. He was wrong by two years. He decided to make a party. And in that party, he took out all the treasures that they stole from the first temple. His grandfather destroyed the temple, Nebuchadnezzar and everything they took to, to Babylon, include the Jewish slaves. So, you know, in the beginning, they didn't plan to take the Jews to exile. They wanted them to stay in Israel and pay taxes. But after 13 years, the, the king over there 
people messed up with his head. Why are you paying them taxes and this? You should rebel against them. That's because of that they came and they destroyed the temple. Meaning, in the beginning, they didn't, come, they didn't want to destroy the temple. It was just occupying Israel. You pay us taxes, we put you, you in charge of paying us the taxes. As long as you pay us, we leave you alone. Freedom, religion, everything. But you know, there's politicians who make problems. And after that, Nebuchadnezzar came and they destroyed the temple. Now seven years passed and he makes a party. He takes out all the gold of Bet HaMikdash, everything. And he puts them in, you know, it's holy things. He puts them in like a show. And everybody comes, all these Bab Babylonians. And then all of a sudden they looked at the wall and they saw a sign. It's written on a wall. Nobody wrote it. It's Mishamayim. What did they see? Mane, Mane, Takal, Veparsin. In Aramic. Nobody knew what it means. Mane, Mane, Takal, Veparsin. Right away, they call Prophet Daniel. He was now the prophet in charge. In, ba in Babylon. Rabbi! Rabbi Daniel! Come quickly! We're having a party here, and something is written on a wall. Please tell us what it means. So the prophet Daniel came. You know, I want to remind you that in those days, nobody knew how to be politically correct, meaning a faker. So whatever they, was the truth, they say right away. So he came and he say, Hashem counted the years of your kingdom, counted Wait your actions, and tonight is going to chop your head off. That's what he told the king, that he's happy in a party, drinking good wine. All of a sudden, a sign on a wall. Tonight Hashem will chop your head off. So he said, no one is coming in and out of the palace tonight. Put guards all the gates. I don't care who. Whoever wants to come in tonight, nobody comes in. No emergency, no nothing, even people you recognize. No one comes in. Like this, I, nothing can happen to me. Who's going to chop my head off? In the meantime, he had one of his assistants. This assistant started to think, you know, the Persians becoming powerful. Koresh is occupying. Soon he's going to come and kill us all. Before it's too late for me, if he will already come here, I'm a dead man. Why shouldn't I think about my future? Let me chop the head of Balshazar, put it in a bag, and I run to Koresh, to the Persians, and give him the head of the king of Babylon. And he right away will give me a special protection. <laughs> He, he, he locked the whole palace. Who killed him? One of his right-hand men. Chopped his head off, took it, and gave it to Koresh. Brought his head here. Koresh was the king of Paras Umadai. Persia and Madai, the areas over there. Achashverosh also did the calculation for seven years also made a mistake. He took the tools of Bet HaMikdash that they took from the Babylonians in the third year of his kingdom. He was a king already for three years. How long the party of Achashverosh was? Huh? Today when you make a wedding, three, four hours, after two hours you're tired already. I want to go home. Wow. We just came, oh, it's, uh, I'm tired, let's go home. <laughs> Two hours. <laughs> Four hours. How long was the party? 180 days. Unlimited wealth. Food as much as you want. Caviar, steaks, anything you can think of. Persian food. 180 days. You know, they say there are two huge miracles in the Megillah. 
huge miracles. One of them is how a Persian man sponsor 180 days of such a party. This the goy. Nobody understands how he became so generous. The second miracle, Esther was in a king in a king's palace for five years, and there was not one trader that told him that she's Jewish. Now one Jew came to tell the king, I want you to know your wife. She doesn't tell you where she's from. But if I'll tell you the secret, would you remember that, your majesty? Your wife is a Jew. Really? Wow, I owe you one. Nobody betray. Today, there will be two million lefties waiting online. King, let me in, I have information for you. Channel 12, the traders, oh, wow. in Israel, they would call every minute to the palace. And we want you to know that your wife is a Jew. Of course, wow, they, they do everything they can to destroy Israel. Someone sent me a list of their staff. Staff that they sent to interview, to take pictures, editing, all Arabs. Channel 12. Ibrahim, Ibrahim, Yusuf, Ahmed, Mustafa. I said, no, no wonder. They, they're working for the Arabs to destroy Israel from within. So, Abotai, Amman comes to Achashverosh and says, Yes, Am Echad, there is a nation, Mefuzar u Mefurad ben Kol Amin. Scattered and separated. Why does he have to say that the Jews are scattered? Why, what's the significance of that? Let's see who is clever. They're not united. They're not a threat. They are a little bit in different communities. They can gather together and cause you any problem. Plus, if you allow me to kill them, no one will even know that they are missing, their absence. Why? It's not like you go to a nation and genocide and kill everyone there. A little bit here, a little bit there, no one will know. They're not an official nation. No one in the history will ever write it down as a genocide. Don't worry. No one will remember you as a king who killed the nation. Why? Because they are in different communities. Pogroms, no big deal. That the M shall not be kulam. The religion is completely different than everybody. Meaning, everyone hates them. They do not align their tradition with our tradition. So everyone hates them. No one will care if you kill them. No one will join to help them. Just as I hate them, everybody else in 127 countries you own, they all hate them. So you have nothing to worry about that the Jews will be able to find someone that care about them. Sounds like it's today, no? This conversation, same story. Why? Because they are different. Nobody likes someone that is not like us. They are different. Check in history. Did you ever hear that any nation came to protect the Jews from anything? Everyone was happy when they're being attacked. When people stole their property, did you ever see demonstrations against it? You have nothing to worry about. When they kicked them from place to place, did you ever see that they were able to do something? Leave them to my hand. I will take care of it. But, but, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking the Jews pay taxes. You're going to lose a lot of income. First, they don't pay so much. They all learn to all day. They're parasites. They don't pay taxes. They all day learn Torah. What do you need them for? They don't contribute to society. They sit with their books all day in the yeshivot. Even their chief rabbi Mordechai all day sits and learns Torah. All of them are religious. They are not helping society. Let's get rid of them. And the few Jews that work, whatever taxes they paid you until now, it's on me. 
You tell me how much, I'm going to give you enough silver or gold. Cover all your losses. Meaning, look how he presented this case. Same claims are in Israel right now, by secular Israelis. You don't pay taxes, you don't work, even though 80% of the religious Jews work and pay taxes, and they pay 17% tax on everything they buy, and they pay 8% on every house they buy to their children, and they pay tons of money, they will continue with that scam. Continue with that scam. You know, in the time of the Holocaust, there were famous people in the world that were very humanic, that the world knew, that, knew about them. One of them was Gandhi from India. Gandhi. One of them was Dr. Schweitzer. Dr. Schweitzer was taking care of the Africans. They ask, he asked the Africans, you know, I'm your doctor, I've been taking care of you for years. Would you agree to publish a letter of support to the Jewish people that are being murdered daily by the Nazis? They all refuse, the Africans. Africans, they refuse to publish any letter that they identified with the Jewish people who are being murdered daily and, you know, genocide. Gandhi from India, same story. Humanic to the whole world and to the dogs, but not to Jewish children, of course. Haman continue, they don't keep the law of the land. They don't pay taxes, they don't volunteer, they, don't, they do not join the army. They're all day with their books. What do we need them for? A bunch of parasites. That's how he prepared the final solution. Remember, same thing Hitler did. It was already done before by his grandfather, Aman. Now the party began. He takes out all the treasures of Bet HaMikdash that he took from the Babylonians. It's written in the Megillah, Ashtia Kadat, En Ones. What does it mean? Drinking according to the religion. There's no force. What does it mean? Meaning, the wine are all kosher. We make sure that the Jews can come. We have mashgiach. We make a section for the Jews, only glad kasher. Let the Jews come and see what used to be in their temple in Jerusalem. No one forced them to drink. And honest. Nobody tell you with a gun, hey, you better drink or I'll kill you. No. Why? Why the Megillah have to write that the wine was kosher and that nobody forced the Jews to drink? Why it's relevant to the story of Purim? Who knows? Who can tell me why? The answer is because if the Goim would force the Jews to drink, if not will kill you, there would not be any sin here. Anus Rahmana Patre. If a goy come with a sword, drink the wine that I touch or I kill you. You drink. And I'm allowed to die. Yay Nesek. The yain is not kosher. Drink or I kill you. Eat pork or I kill you. I'll eat. I don't have to die. You know, there's a big argument. There's a big argument if a Jew is allowed to lie to say that he's a goy, if his life is in a risk. The life of a Jew, you have a goyim come, they're looking for Jews to kill them. So let's say in the old days everyone had beards and people wearing all kinds of turbans. So let's see if he had any, any things that identify him as a Jew, he threw it out. He speaks Arabic or whatever the language of the place, French, whatever. They come to him, what are you? He say, I'm an Arab. Arab also circumcised. So he cannot tell, oh, you're circumcised, you're a Jew. No, I'm an Arab. 
Arab circumcised as well. Speak Arabic, pretend he's an Arab, they leave him alone. He say a few words from the whatever they tell him to say. They leave him alone and he's go back, going back to his community and, and live another 40 years. Is he allowed to do it or no? Ah, huh? what do you think? Pikuach nefesh. Your life is in a risk. You can save your life by saying that you're not a Jew. Are you allowed or not allowed? Allowed. Ma, what do you think? Shulchan Aruch Rabotai Shulchan Aruch says it's not allowed not allowed you can see in Siman Kuf Nun Vav but there's big arguments about it because in the Talmud Yerushalmi it sounds like that a person is allowed to do such thing the argument is, when a person say, I'm one of you, that's considered like a part of idol worshipping. If a Christian comes to kill you, and he asks you, are you a Jew? You say, no, what are you? I'm Christian. Just by saying such thing, if you became an idol worshipper or not. That's the argument. Idol worshipping, you have to die not to agree. No matter what. The question is, is this considered idol worshipping or no? When someone said that he's a non-Jew because he doesn't want to die, is this a sign that he gave an approval to, to an idol? That's the argument. Look how sensitive it is when it comes to idol worshipping. But it's written in Shulchan Aruch. <laughs> it's written in Shulchan Aruch Rabotai. If you want, I can read to you something that I saw today. It says like this, look. Shulchan Aruch, the Psak in Shulchan Aruch, Asur le'adam lomar shu goi kedei shelo yargu. A Jew is not allowed to say that he's a goi in order for the goim not to kill him. Not allowed. Meaning, they're going to kill him for sure. They came to kill Jews. So now, it, when you hear it, it sounds a little bit strange. We know if they tell you murder someone else, if not we murder you, you're not allowed to murder. Gilui arayot, shfichut damim, and avodah zara, you're not allowed to do. But what is, what, which one of the three is here? I just want to leave. If they tell you bow down to my idol to prove to me that you're not a Jew, that's a different story. For sure you have to die. No argument here. But if they don't, uh, they don't bring an idol. They don't tell you to pray to their idol. They just ask you, are you a Jew or not? You say, yeah, they, sh they chop your head off. You say, no, they leave you alone. Are you supposed to say, yes, I'm a Jew? Then let them kill you. The Torah said, Ela mitzvot asher yaseh otam adam v'chai bahem. Right? It's written in Leviticus 18, verse 5 that a person should live thanks to the mitzvot, not should die for that. The Rambam writes, Be'ilchot Yesodea Torah, chapter 5, the Rambam writes, En lecha davar aumet bifnei pikuach nefesh, ela shalosh averot achamurot. Nothing, nothing, nothing justify life risk, except those three famous sins. So in that's the case, why Shulchan Aruch writes that you're not allowed to say? Because by, when a Jew denies identity, it's included in Avodah Zarah. In Avodah Zarah you have to die. But now comes all the arguments. There is arguments, there's a whole long sugya they bring from the Yerushalmi, it's the same for men, the same for women. Some of the Rishonim disagree with this. It's not so simple. There was big arguments about it between the poskim. They say from the Yerushalmi, we understand that you're allowed to pretend that you are a goy in a time of uh, trouble, in the middle of a pogrom or something like that. 
For instance, when the Arabs came in October 7, and if they came to one of the houses, and let's say one of them were uh, Israeli who knows how to speak Arabic in a perfect Arabic accent. There are many Israelis like this. That they put them in Gaza, they pretend to be Arabs all the time. Mr. Arvim. Let's say they came to a house of one of them. And he started to talk to them Arabic and pretend that he's one of them, and they let him, let him live. Did he actually break the law? According to Shulchan Aruch, yes. But maybe no, maybe it's not the same. Why? Because Arabs, to begin with, are not idol worshippers. Yeah, they follow a fake religion. It's not a religion of God. But they don't bow down to any idol, and they don't bow down to any man, and they don't say God have a son or anything like that. So now, is it the same thing when an Arab comes and says, are you a Jew? You tell them no. What happens if he comes and says to you, okay, say words of uh, Islam? Bismillah, Rahmanah, Rahman al Rahim, Muhammad, uh, the Prophet. Words that prove that to him that you're really a Muslim. You know, there is one uh, friend of mine, his name is Tzvika Yechizkeli. He's a reporter in a TV. He's a Baal Tshuva. So he's an expert to the Arabic world. He goes to countries of Arabs into the mask of the most dangerous terrorist in the world. Kill Jews, all, that's all over there in the mosques. Pretend that he's an Arab, speak perfect Arabic. They take him in a taxi in all kinds of Syria places. You're not going to believe. <laughs> They speak to him Arabic, they don't, they, have no, they don't even dream that an Israeli Jew. His Arabic is so good. He made a series of, uh, of his candy camera, how he filmed all these Nazis in a mask, how all they talk about is to slaughter all Jews. To show the naive lefties that there's really no difference, there's no such thing, terrorist or not terrorist. Everybody wants to kill all Jews. Everybody. If you find one out of a thousand who wants to let Jews live, it's going to be a huge miracle. You have to make a party. You found one out of a thousand that agreed that Jews would continue to live. Almost impossible. If you check that Arab's history, it's probably not one of the children of Ishmael. Probably his grand grandparents came from Europe, from different country, and became Arabs later on. Anyway, Rabotai, we move on. So Achashverosh makes a party. He did not force the Jews to drink. Mordechai was standing by the door, begging them not to enter. They told him, Rabbi, don't be fanatic. We're going to the glad kosher section. We're not going to mix with the goyim. Was that a mixed party or a separate men and women? Of course separate. The Goim did not dare to mix men and women. <laughs> if you go to an Arab party today, what, men and women are mixed? No. Men is in one place, women in another place. Go to a wedding of the Hamas in Gaza. You're going to have men and women dance on the dance floor? Do you know what would happen to them? They come with machine guns, ta 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 ta. You have on, on YouTube how few times they came to a, a party that the Arabs did quietly. Not that they danced together with the girls. The girls were there and the boys were here. But the girls were able to be seen by the guys. So they came and killed all of them with machine guns. <laughs> so how do we know that it was not mixed? It's written clearly. Vashti made a party for the women. Women's party and men party. It's not mixed. So if that's the case, all the non-Jewish girls were very modest in those days, 2,400 years ago. So everyone is modest. Everyone covered their hair. Their food is glad kosher. The Jews have their own section. So what's wrong? Why the chief rabbi Mordechai He's standing by the door and crying and begging the Jews not to enter. And they don't care, they go in anyway. 
Imagine you go to a party of some guy, and Rav Ovadi has a tzal standing by the door and begging you, please go, my son, please don't go in. So Rabbi, what's the problem? The food is kosher? Kosher. The wine is kosher? Kosher. They put a mashgiach? Yes. So why you don't want me to go in? There's no pritzut here. So what's, what's, what bothers Mordechai? What, what is this problem? Let the Jews enjoy. What's the problem? What's the problem? The answer is, Bet HaMikdash is destroyed. All the Kelim of Bet HaMikdash, all the holy Kelim, are now being vandalized. They use them like hole, like garbage. Everyone can come, touch it. This, is, this was in the house of God in Jerusalem. The destruction of the temple became a party for the Goim. The Goim come and see and enjoy that the house of God is destroyed in Jerusalem and the Jews are in exile, have, have no rights. So they want you to come, you know, like to stab you under the belt. How are they going to make you come? They're going to serve pork. You're going to come? No, everyone is religious. They're going to make a show with girls. You're going to come? No. They have to make it kosher. If they force you to drink, Mordechai has no claim. Hashem has no claim. If a guy forced me to drink wine, and if I don't drink, he'll kill me, I have no sin. I don't deserve any punishment. That's why it's written, Rabotai, and every word is calculated. What? Ashtia kadat, meaning according to the, to the religion. Glad kosher wine is not yain nesech. And honest. There's nothing by force. Drink as much as you want. Nobody force you. Mordechai is begging not to enter. Now between me and you. What is the huge sin that because of that Hashem decided that all Jews have to die? Millions of Jews going to die for participating in a party of the king. In a White House, Hussein Obama made a Hanukkah party every year. To all his liberal transgender Jews. Sleepy Joe, the same thing. Almost all his staff are liberal reform Jews. Reshaim, Arurim, Chad Echad. So he makes them a Hanukkah party. What happens if now Trump is going to go into the White House? He's not an enemy of Israel. He's not anti-Jewish. He would like to make a kosher party to invite famous rabbis. He's done it a few times in the past when he was in the White House. And they will invite a rabbi. Is he allowed to go or no? He's going to definitely make everything glad kosher. Every, they light men Hanukkah, they make brachot. Definitely they're not going to make mixed party. They know there's rabbis there. So what is the problem? And if you say there is a problem, is this problem is so big that you deserve a holocaust for that? Holocaust? The holocaust in Europe happened after 150 years of assimilation. 150 years, Jews more and more and more are leaving Hashem, leaving the Torah, leaving the yeshivot, going to Berlin's universities, to all kinds of horrible places, marrying non-Jews, almost 80%. Disaster! Hashem said, another 20, 30 years, now one Jew would be left in Europe. The Satan were demanding retaliation, and that's what happened. But here, for something like this to deserve a holocaust, you compare this to 150 years of assimilation, that religious Jews came to drink glad kosher wine and eat some Persian rice and some gondi? I don't get it. You know, you know what's the reason? Remember what I told you in the first minute that I started my speech tonight? There are two kinds of sins in the Torah. Isurim de Oraita and Isurim de Rabbanan. The Torah says you're not allowed to eat pork. You eat pork, you broke a law from Hashem. You're not allowed to break Shabbat. You broke Shabbat, you violated instruction directly from Hashem. There are laws that the Chachamim made. 
חכמים say, not allowed to eat chicken with dairy. The Torah say meat. The Chachamim say chicken can confuse people. It looks like veal. It looks the same. Someone would see someone eating grind uh, meatball, which is really from chicken, together with melted cheese or, or drink milk. It will confuse a lot of people. They made a decree. Ah, I don't care. The Chachamim made it. It's not for me. I don't wait six hours. It's, ra it's Rabbanan. This is a rabbinical sin. Plus another sin from the Torah. In Parashat Shoftim, Hashem said, everything the Chachamim rule, you must listen to them. Do not move left or right. If you would, you have to die. Uviyar Ta'arami Yisrael. Meaning someone who disrespects the decrees of Chazal and even say such thing in his mouth. Ah, Zera Banan. Don't be fanatic. It's rabbinical. Just by saying it, broke one of the main rules of the Torah, which is a death penalty. Most ignorant Jews have no idea what they do. Ah, I'm not so strict, it's the Rabbanan. It's only Rabbanan, Rabbanan, Rabbi. What Rabbanan? Rabbanan are your friends from college? What, what, what do you mean Rabbanan? You know who was Rabbanan? You wake them up in the middle of the night, they'll tell you the whole Torah in reverse. From, from the end to the beginning, no exaggeration. You know who was Ezra Sofer? Every name in the Torah you say, it will tell you in every parasha how many times it appears. You don't have people like this today. Every pasuk in the Torah, Yerovam ben Nevat was Rasha Merusha Machti Arabim. Yerovam ben Nevat. The Gemara say on every subject of the Torah, he could have given you 127 different lectures. Completely different. Completely different. Each lecture on this verse in the Torah, completely different than the previous one, than the previous one. 127 different lectures on one Pasuk in the Torah. And I'm, I assume that every lecture was at least an hour or more. And he was Rasha. Imagine the Tzadikim. When the Tzadikim made a decree and it's written in the Torah that Hashem gave them full authority and you rebel against them, that means you rebel against Hashem. hundred <laughs> percent. That's what happened over here. The chief rabbi, the holy Mordechai, standing and crying by the door and they ignore him. Rabbi, you exaggerate, you're too fanatic. It's a new generation, Rabbi. It's the generation of Facebook. It's not what used to be when you were in our age. Rabbi, please understand us. We are Americans. We are Americans. It's different. We're not your age. Me and my wife are 25. Rabbi, you're in your <laughs> already one leg in Olam Abba. It's called Emunat Chachamim. A Holocaust was about to come for disrespecting the chief rabbi. For that, everyone will die. Because it's written in Parashat Shoftim. Death penalty for that. That's the reason for the decree of Aman. Nothing else was wrong in a party. The wine was kosher, there was no women, there was section for the Jews. The women were in a different party, Bichlal. What was the problem? Yeah, the treasures of Bet HaMikdash. But come on, you have to admit that you, you're very curious. Who wouldn't want to see that Kelim of Bet HaMikdash? People who grew up in Persia. They never saw Bet HaMikdash. Now you're able to see what you learn in a, in a Torah. All these things you read in a Torah, in a parasha that we just read on Shabbat. Pikodei and Vayakel, all this. You want to see in your own eyes how it looks. Wow. This was from the time of Shlomo HaMelech, that means Shlomo HaMelech touched it. Who wouldn't want to see it? That's not the main punishment. The punishment is that Mordechai was warning them and this, this, this obeys decree. So Vashti now make a party. Mishte Anashim. Asher Lamelech HaChashverosh. Chazal say, Vashti say to HaChashverosh, 
let's put a part, let's, let's put a separation, mechitza, get the Jews drunk, and then we take over the separation. Like this, we fool them. Why? Because we know that their God hate, hate lack of modesty. Elokehem sonezima. And we will cause them to get a huge punishment. Look how they used to think, the anti-Semites of those days. That's how the Arab thinks today, the Hamas, all of them. The Hamas, they think, how should we make the Jews do things that their God will punish them? They think in a religious way. Other nations, they fight each other, they don't mix religion. It's a political thing. Every time it's written in a Megillah, Hamelech, only a Melech, without the word Achashverosh. Who are we talking here about? We're talking about Hashem. We're talking also on Achashverosh, but also about Hashem. When it says King Achashverosh, it's only Achashverosh, not Hashem. When it says Amelech, it's both. It's Achashverosh, but at the same time it matches what Hashem also wanted to do, or did, or thought. It's hinting to Akadosh Baruch Hu. So what does it mean when it's written Katov Lev Amelech Bayain as the king is happy from the wine? You know, the Gemara say nothing makes a person happier than a wine. I wonder if it's include whiskey as well or vodka. Maybe what they meant is the alcohol. In the old days, mainly the main alcohol was mainly the wine, good wines from the barrel. But uh, you all know that when a person drink wine, after a drink of uh, one or two glasses, they already begin to move like a monkey. Smiling, loud, <laughs> banging on the table. By women is a life risk. They completely lose themselves. They'll cry after that for 40 years after that. If you give them a few, few, few glasses of wine, that's their end. So what does it mean? Katov lev amelech bayain. If we're talking about Hashem, Ma, Hashem drank wine and he's in a good mood? Hashverosh drank wine. So katov lev, lev amelech bayain. But what, uh, you say that every time you say melech without a Hashverosh, that means Hashem. The answer, yain shel kiddush, that the nation of Israel does kiddush. Who pashat achashverosh v'sarav, right? New shikorim pshat lo pshat achashverosh v'sarav. Achashverosh and his ministers they all became drunk, and they decided to argue which women are the prettiest in the world. You know how the ignorant people when they sit together, the guys. One guy is Italian, one guy is Arab, one guy is Israeli, bunch of fools. They all sit together in a bar drinking and now begin to argue which women, which country have the prettiest women in the world. But forget about it, you come to Iraq, every woman there, Ma, Iraq, what are you talking about? No, in Italy, no, what are you talking in America, no, in, in Scandinavia. Then, of course, the Israeli, ah, you guys, you have to come to Israel. You don't know what you're talking about. That's what they argue about, the fools. This is what Achashverosh and his ministers, they have different background. Everyone is claiming that the women of his place are the prettiest. So now, <laughs> now it's time to prove. Achashverosh said, do you know any woman prettier than Vashti? Ah, no, she's very pretty, but come on, no, bring her. They're all drunk now. Last is with the women. Go bring her. That's the beginning of the salvation of the Jewish nation from this planned Holocaust. That moment. The Gemara say, right now, Hashem came into action. Giving the idea to these fools that to drink a lot and to speak all their shtuyot, which women are the prettiest. And one say, yeah, you claim your wife is the prettiest? Bring her, let's see. 
And this fool, without drinking, he wouldn't agree to bring his wife in front of everyone, right? Some husbands, they tell their wife, why don't you put makeup when you leave the house? Smart or stupid? Smart husband, he wants his wife to attract attention from strangers in the street? No. <laughs> but today it's all backwards. Everything is upside down today. Tell me, why are you dressed like this? How do you want me to dress? More attached! Why it's so long? Why don't you grow long nails? Why don't you put red lipstick? Ma, you want people to look at me on the street? Yeah, you should dye your hair like this. <laughs> he goes to a wedding, he wants to break. You fool, you don't, you know, it doesn't bother you that 50 men is going to look and think all kinds of things about your wife. You're normal. Forget about religion. Minimum of decency. Common sense, normal, uh, I don't know, India, uh, idol worshiper in India. He told him, hey, Maharaji, you want people to think about your wife in Chigdana? <laughs> no? Everybody here thinks about the Chigdana tonight. Where? Pull up this pistol right away. Why is angry, Maharaji? Why is angry? It's not a Bachur Yeshiva. He bowed down to the cow five minutes ago. Why is he angry? He just found out that all the, the Indians are over there thinking bad things about his wife. Not sure is it such a tzaddik or mashu. So how do you have Jews today that are Shomer Shabbat and that's how they think? How? How, how much more stupid you want to be? I told you once I was in Miami, so in a lecture over there in a fancy place by the beach, nice view, lots of people. I talked about modesty. I said to the guy, I don't get it. You agreed that your wife would go downstairs here to the beach in front of all the goim there with bathing suit? Everyone goes. I said to him, I don't get it. You, 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 when people walk and look at her, what, what do you know what they think about your wife, the mother of your children? Listen, everyone is like this. It's the way of the world. So I say to him, imagine your wife made you a birthday party here tonight. <laughs> Invite your father, your brothers, your colleagues, your children, everyone is sitting here in the living room. And she comes out of the bedroom with a birthday cake, with bikini and high heels shoes. Yom to Moshe. Front of 300 men there. In your fancy penthouse in Collins Avenue. She comes like this with a cake, with bathing suit. <laughs> this Moroccan guy, his blood started to boil. Just from the scenario. <laughs> it never happened. I'm just hypothetically speaking, I ask him, imagine she come like this with a bathing suit in front of everyone in the living room. So he say I would grab her with a cake and fly her out of the window. And she's there, there. <laughs> she's listening. She's sitting there. I say, why? She's going to embarrass me like this? I said, I don't get it. <laughs> your ears should listen to your foolish mouth. If she comes with bikini right here, you, you want to kill her. But that's only 300 guests. And if she walks in front of 20,000 across the street, you have no problem. So, well, when you describe it like that, it is a problem. You just never thought about it. So Vashti, now they invite Vashti to come. So what's the problem? She doesn't want to come. Not because she's such a modest rebitzen. Why she doesn't want to come? She had leprosy, rash in the skin. They wanted her to wear something to show her beauty. She didn't want. She's not today able to do it. She refused to come. Who gave her leprosy? Who gives a person leprosy? Tzarat. 
Hashem. Why? If was a Jew, leprosy come for the Shonara. Speak gossip about someone. Mida keneged Mida. You want to isolate him, to lose his friends, to be banned in society. That's what's going to happen to you. You're going to have leprosy. Nobody can come near you. They push you out of the camp. For one week, you isolated, measure for measure. You wanted him to be lonely, we're going to make you lonely. But what is it when it comes to a goyim, if a goy spoke Lashon Ara, he gets leprosy? Ma pitom? Absolutely not. This is a miracle that Hashem did for the Jews, to show them a direct punishment for the others to see the measure for measure. The goyim speak Lashon Ara, eventually they'll get their punishment. So why she got leprosy? Because she would put down the Jewish girls, force them to work for her, tell them to dress open. Ah, come on, you're too religious. Open up the shirt. Bring up your sleeves. And she forced them to work on Shabbat. We need you, I need you on Shabbat, you're a waitress here. You're working for the queen. Don't come like this, look like a rabbit sand. We have people here. I want you to show yourself. Put some lipstick. Put some this. Put some that. So that's what they did to her. Don't come with your clothes. Come with minimal clothes that everybody can see that you're the prettiest wife of the king. Mida keneged mida. But how will Hashem make her refuse to come? If she would come, that would be the end of it. The next day, no one will remember everything. They're all drunk anyway. The only way they will, rem the only way that it's going to be a big deal when she rebel against the king. That's it. That's a disaster. Now the king doesn't know what to do. According to the law, a wife that rebel against the king has to be put to death. But the Hashverosh now is not drunk anymore. He loves her. He doesn't want to lose her. Plus, he only became a king thanks to her. She's a fourth generation from Nebuchadnezzar. And it's not good for him to kill her now. Bad for business. Vaikra lachachamim yodei aitim. He called the smart scholars those who know times. What are we talking here about? To the Jews. To the rabbis. What does it mean, your day team? They know how to renew the moon. Calculation of the moon every month. Remember, there was no calendar yet. Every month, the Chachamim knows exactly when is the renewal of the moon. To announce Rosh Chodesh. No one in the world knows it. Only the Chachamim, from, from rabbi to student. The Chachamim, your day team. They know times. They know how to calculate. They know when it's going to be Yom Kippur, when Pesach is going to be based on their based on their calculation. They know how to make a leap here. Like this year, we have 13 months. Adar Aleph, Adar Bet. We're now in Adar Bet. Purim, it's in a week. Purim should have, done, should have been three weeks ago. We pushed another month into the calendar to postpone Passover. Why? That it shouldn't be in a cold weather in Israel. Now everything's starting to bloom. Another month, Passover, it's going to be beautiful, spring, hot. So every 19 years, you push seven more months into the calendar. Adar bet. You know, one rabbi in Israel just had a boy. He's 88 years old. This thing has been married for 40 years, couldn't have kids. His wife is, uh, I think it's his second wife, I think his first wife passed, or so, I don't know the whole story. But now he has a second wife, she's younger, she's in her 50s. Even a woman in her 50s, it's not easy to give birth, you know. Someone once told me, I don't know how reliable is this, that if a woman was active, meaning she was married, she had a few kids, and then she got divorced, or her husband died. And then a few years later, after not being married for 10 years, she got remarried, 
even if she's in her late 40s, she's still productive, meaning she can still have kids because her system was active all these years. That means if someone was never active, never until age 40 something, never, never, never been pregnant, it lowers the chances. But you know, we the Jewish people cannot go by statistic. Because the Torah says, we are above the mazal, it's all in the end of Hashem. Hashem wants, here you go. So now he had a baby. This baby was born in Adar Bet. In his bar mitzvah, there will not be Adar Bet. In the year, <laughs> when he will be bar mitzvah, hopefully his father will still be alive. If he's 88 now, it's going to be 101. In his bar mitzvah. In his wedding, it's going to be 108. Hopefully he will be around. <laughs> What do you think? He has a good chance to make it or no? Yes. The father. <coughs> now he has a reason to live. Yes. Sometimes when you get to almost 90 years old, you're already fed up with your life. You married all your children. If you're a wealthy man, you bought them houses, you help them financially. Everyone is independent. Now you're suffering. You have all kinds, you know, an old man or an old woman. Doctor, in and out, doctor, surgery, this, katarat teeth, all kinds of problems, you know what, I, uh, take me already, what am I doing here? Oh, all of a sudden, unexpected new baby. It took you back 40 years in age. Revive your young, <laughs> young days. There's a reason to live now. You have a baby in your bedroom. You're an old man with a cane, all of a sudden, wow, what happened? I'm going to jog. Yesterday you couldn't walk up the stairs, now you're going jogging. My life came back. Psychologically. You know, a lot of old people, they have problems in their mind to fix the body. So, the rabbis now have a big dilemma. Oily mi yitzri, oily mi yotzri, like Rashbi said. Oily if Omar, oily if no Omar. Or if we will answer his question, or if we don't answer his question. He wants to know if he must, he must throw Vashti out of the palace or kill her. Haman right away jumped. Hey, your majesty. She must be severely punished that no other women will ever dare to rebel against their husband. Don't open a gate for feminism. Haman the chauvinist. What would you like? That the whole 127 countries will talk about what kind of a loser you are? Haman. Haman. <coughs> Why Haman wants Vashti to die? You know, politicians they always have a hidden agenda. Even though they, they pretend that they care about justice or morality, don't ever buy it. There is always another reason why they speak like that. Like the former trader prime minister with a quarter on his head. <laughs> to go with the Muslim brothers and the lefties, even though I swore in writing that I won't do it. How many more elections Israel can have? It will destroy the country. I do it for my country. <laughs> you do it for the chair, you little low life. Rasha Merusha. You care about the country? You're going to give 43, f f f what is it, 53 billion shekel to Hamas? Muslim brother is Hamas. They started Hamas. Muslim brothers, it's Hamas, what you got in October 7. This is who we formed the government with. With Nazis who call for death to all Jews. And you saw what they did to children and women. Put them in a microwave and press start. Those were his people sitting with him in the government. And he gave them 53 billion to be his partners that he should become a prime minister. And then when I talk against him, he sues me. In a court. Why? Well, cannot handle the truth. <laughs> truth hurts. 
So the question is, Rabotai, why Haman want Vashti to die? Yeah, he has a reason that his daughter will marry Achashverosh instead. And then he will make a coup, a revolution. He will steal the kingdom. He's already powerful. He's the richest man in the world. The richest guy in the world was Haman. Who was the richest Jew? Korach. Until today in Israel, Israelis say, Ashir ka Korach. I have no idea what they're saying. Ashir ka Korach means wealthy like Korach. Ask any Israeli in Tel Aviv, what does it mean, Ashir ka Korach? I have no idea. So what do you say now? Everybody say it. So, Rabotai, Haman wants his daughter to become the princess, the, the, the queen. So Haman says, I suggest that we fix the law. That the king can judge his own relative. There was a law there in Persia that the king can judge every stranger, but not his own children or his own wife, which is normal, right? How can a judge judge, judge in a court his own wife? So they made a fair rule. Haman say, I suggest we change the law, that you should judge rush to yourself. Mordechai says, whatever I'm going to say, it's going to be bad. If I say she, she deserves to die, later they'll blame the Jews. If I say you should keep her alive, they'll blame the Jews. So what are we going to do? So Mordechai and the other rabbis that he asked say, from the time the temple was destroyed, we do not know anymore how to judge matters of life and death. There's no Sanhedrin. There's no Bet HaMikdash. We are not allowed. Look what a trick they did to him. That's against the religion now to judge life and death. We cannot judge our own people. Why? Sometimes you have to know in life when to be quiet. Not everything you hear, you have to make a comment. Today the people are so empty, whatever they hear, according to my opinion, that should be, who are you exactly? You the Rambam? Everyone is a blog today. Everyone became a reporter. Everyone is Monday Amar. Every reporter became a minister after five years in the government. What's going on here? He has a talk show. They bring Esther now. Instead of Vashti, the king wants a new wife. Now he sends his people to look for pretty Persian girls. They walk around. You, what's your name? Come, come. I'm a representative of King Ahasuerus. We would like to bring you to an interview. What's the interview for? Don't you want to be a queen? Of course. Of course. Don't worry, come. They bring her to the palace. Go like this, to the right, to the left. We'll make an album, we'll get back to you. They bring her hundreds of women. But one of them saw Esther. It's all for Hashem. The Holocaust has is, is been planned now. Hashem, when he has a decree against his children, there's always the remedy ready before. Makdim trufa la maka. Before the strike, the remedy was made already. We say it every morning in a tefillah, who knows when? When we pray shachrit, what do we say? <coughs> Where in a tefillah it says that before Hashem gives us the smack, He already gave us the cold ice we're <laughs> waiting to put. Where does it say? Baruch gozer umkayem. Bless he the one who make the decree on us and he is the one who always gave us the solution and the remedy. It's already ready for you. 
So Rabotai, they bring Esther to the palace and Achashverosh likes her from all the pretty women. By the way, Esther, she was pretty or no? no. Not like the other girls. But she had a charm. She wasn't the prettiest. Mara said she was Yera Crockett. Maybe she was too skinny, she was greenish. Pale, I don't know how to call it. Yera Crockett. Maybe, maybe, yellow skin, maybe. How old was she? Huh? How old was she? Was she young? No, she was also old. So, I they bring Esther to the palace. Five years she's been married to that guy. Allowed or not allowed? Jewish woman allowed to let the guy touch her? Not allowed. It's a horrible scene, huge. You'd seen. So how Esther agree? Boy, I don't wanna, I don't wanna be married to the king. We'll kill you. Kill me. Solika, you heard about Solika? In Morocco there's a grave of Solika. The prince, the Muslim prince, son of the king of Morocco, saw her, she was a very pretty girl. He decided to marry her. She refused. She was a religious Moroccan Jew. They torture there in every possible torture. She didn't agree. They tied her to a horse. They pull her in town in front of thousands of Muslim people. Then she screamed, stop! The horse stopped. They thought, nah, that's it, she's breaking. She said, I would like a safety, please bring me safety pin. Safety pin. What's going on here? They got curious. Bring her quickly safety pin. She took the safety pin, you know, her dress, when you tie someone to a horse and the horse run, the wind makes the skirt comes up. It's not mothers for a girl, they ever want to see her legs. She took the safety pin and stuck the skirt below the knees into her skin with a safety pin. Now you can pull me to my death. Meaning in the last moments of her life, the only thing she had in mind is that my dignity and my honor as a modest Jewish girl will not be destroyed right now. When you hear about our grandmothers, how holy they were, it breaks the heart to see the girls today, how they behave. On social media, so cheap, so... to vomit, to vomit. <coughs> Stories you hear about what women would do. I don't know if to. You should cry for months. You should cry that girls became so low and so cheap, with zero dignity, zero honor to themselves. Like a piece of meat. Uh, butcher shop. Right? How much is this? How much is that? <sighs> it's sad because even by the Goyim, 100, 120 years ago, the Goyot would die and not agree to walk not modest on the street. I told you about the pictures that I have from South Carolina Beach from 110 years ago. South Carolina Beach. What? All the goyot there with the gowns like this, covered, everything. The goyot with umbrellas. If a, if a man passed, they put the umbrella like this, that so they don't see. Who, who, and plus, she's covering her hair with a hat and a net. The net hides the face. And if a man comes, they put the umbrella down. Did you ever hear about a woman, a Goya, that will walk with a bathing suit? hundred years ago? <laughs> You're out of your mind. So if the Goyot were like this, needless to say, the Jews, look what it became. Uh, what can I say? You know, I once told a story who got me into trouble in the Israeli TV. You know, in the Gemara, there is an expression called Ashrecha 
שנתפסת על דברי תורה. רבי עקיבא was 120 years old. The goyim call him teaching Torah. The Romans say you're not allowed to teach Torah. Anyone who will catch teaching Torah, we will execute him. Brutally. So when they put Rabbi Akiva in jail, they brought also Papus, another Jew. They brought him for different reasons, for business, for fraud, for something like that. They both sitting in the same cell. Does this Papus warn Rabbi Akiva? Akiva, you're not afraid to teach Torah in public? Don't you know the Caesar, the Roman? They say anyone who teach Torah, they will catch him and kill him and poke his brain out? Why do you go against the government? Rabbi Akiva said to him, you know the fox, he came to the lake and he saw the fish swimming. And the fish are maneuvering, trying to escape the net of the fishermen. So the fox said to the fish, why don't you come up to the land, live with me together in peace and harmony. Like this, I will save you from the net of the fishermen. So the fish told him, you are the smart fox, the shual. They said that you're clever, no? If here, when this is our territory and we can run and escape and swim and we are fighting for our life, Perhaps we will succeed, perhaps we will die. You suggest we go up to the land that for sure will die? Where is your brain? Of course, he's a, a snake. Why does he want them to come up to the land? That he can swallow them alive. <laughs> Why the Chilonim are so anxious that the religious Bachurei Shivot will go to the army? We will get rid of all religious people in one generation. That's it. Israel will become our dream, a land of goyim. No more yeshivot, no more synagogues, no more mikveh, no more rabbis. Gay marriage, everyone naked. Wow, it's our dream. They are annoying. These 200,000 learners, we got to get rid of them. There's no way to get rid of them. Send them to the army. In three years, they're all going to take off the keeper. That's what happened to them. They need, uh, they need soldiers. There's 80,000 soldiers now on a strike while the war is still going. 80,000. So sit at home. We'll call you if we need you. They don't need. There's enough soldiers. It's nothing to do with the army. They just want to, like the Greeks, destroy the religion. <laughs> So the fish said, Rabbi Akiva said to Papus, the Torah said that the only thing that saves the Jewish nation from destruction is the Torah. Thanks to the Torah we survive all the empires, all the tragedies, all the antisemitism. What keeps us always around is the Torah. Everyone who came to kill us, Hashem wiped them all out. We are still one nation after thousands of years, thanks to the Torah. Without it, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't have a nation. Now, you telling, uh, telling me to stop teaching Torah because I should be afraid of the Romans? you normal. If anything will save us from the Romans, is teaching Torah. In the end, they caught Rabbi Akiva. They put him in jail. And who comes the next day? Papus. The liberal Jew and the rabbi are in the same jail. No, Papu say to Rabbi Akiva, Shrecha, Rabbi Akiva, how lucky you are that you are captured because of the great Torah. You say words of Torah and for that you came to jail. Look at me, Papus. I am in the same place like you, but not for teaching Torah, for nonsense. Both of us are going to die. But at least you take something with you to the next world. You taught Torah to the nation. What, the, what can I take with me? Papus, do you know what was his job? What was his job? What was he doing? Huh? 
He was visiting the sick, releasing prisoners, doing a lot of great things. Why does it say, Oy li papu shenitpasti al dvarim betelim. Oy, that I was captured for nonsense. He was a big tzaddik, this papus. He wasn't like it looks like some liberal, lefty enemy of Hashem. No. He just was afraid for the life of Rabbi Akiva. He said, Akiva, you're not afraid to get caught and to kill you like this? You're the most important rabbi in the world. If the Romans will catch you, it will be the end of you. In the end, both of them are in the same jail. So he said to him, wow, you're lucky. They are prosecuting you for teaching Torah. I'm also prosecuted, but for nonsense. The Chachamim say nonsense. You know what the tzaddik he was? Visiting the sick is not a big mitzvah. Everyone who visits the sick revives his nefesh. Someone who doesn't visit the sick, it's like spilling his blood, the Gemara say. So he was running, running to visit the sick. Why dvarim betelim? Why nonsense? Compared to teaching Torah, it's a huge nonsense. Anything, anything, it's nonsense compared to teaching Torah. Anything. Any mitzvah, any great chesed is a joke. Joke to even try to compare it to teaching Torah. So he said to Rabbi Akiva, you were caught for something important. I was caught for nonsense. So I got into trouble for a few times for saying the truth of the Torah. It's an honor to be caught by the lefty liberal wicked enemies of Hashem. And they target you and listening to my lectures to see what they can take out and put on the news. And then make a lot of false kinds of claims. That's an honor. To be caught for saying the exact truth of Hashem in the Torah. Like Mechalel Shabbat Mot Yuma. They go crazy when they hear it. <laughs> so I have to be afraid of them? To read a verse from the Torah? So I once talked about the women in the Holocaust. You know, the Nazis, and we finish right here, and the rest of the Purim I'll finish tomorrow in Brooklyn, because I have a lot more interesting stuff for tomorrow. I'll just finish with the story. So the, the Nazis in Machshimam, when they before they murdered the Jews in the gas chambers, they told them, take off your clothes, hang that on the hooks, the hooks has number, and don't forget your number. We're putting you in a shower. When you come out of the shower, you should remember where your clothes are. And they separated the men and the women separately. The men were naked in one place, and the women were naked in a different place. I said, how lucky, if you can call it lucky, Spiritually lucky. Physically, everybody died in the end. Almost everybody. But spiritually, mentally, how lucky were the Jews in that moment that the Nazis put men separate and women separate. Imagine if they put all of them mixed and they ordered them to take off their clothes. You would have to stand naked in front of your father, in front of your mother, in front of your grandmother, in front of your sister, in front of your, your, wife's, sis, your wife's wife. It was a disaster. The wife of the rabbi would stand next to you without clothes. It would be a disaster for religious people. Believe me, it's a million times worse than death. Death, you get a bullet to death, you go to heaven. Standing for hours with all the people, men, women, brothers, sisters, rabbis, students. You know what a disaster it is? You see the chief rabbi standing next to you with his wife with no clothes. Think about it. How Hashem had mercy on them in the last hour of their life that these monsters put men separate and women separate. Think about it. They did everything they can to torture the Jews mentally, not just physically. What made them separate them? That they were completely in two different places. And they took pictures. So when they came to the women to take their pictures, there were two kinds of girls. There were religious girls 
and secular girls. So, you know, the secular girls, they don't think religion, they don't think Olam Abba. They're, they're not religious. So they are desperate. They took away their children, they stand like this, they know they're about to die. They gave up on life, on, on everything. They stood like this and they came and took their pictures. And those are the pictures that you see in the Yad Vashem Museum. They put these women that you see them without clothes, with no shame. Such monsters, these Zionim. They make a museum to show the world what the Nazis did to the Jews, and they put pictures of Jewish women an hour before they murdered them in gas chambers. After they took off their clothes, they, the Nazis took pictures. They found those pictures after the war, and they put them on all over the wall in a museum. Children, people come, goyim, see our grandmother standing without clothes. They have no shame. These Israeli monsters, they have no shame. So I was talking about it. If it would be his mother, he would put her picture in Yad Vashem Museum. For a billion dollars, he wouldn't agree to do it. Ah, for a different Jewish woman, no problem. Then I asked, but how the Jewish women agree to take pictures? Why didn't they cover themselves? Then I caught the part that I read in Rav Zilberstein book that he wrote over there. When they came to the religious women to take pictures of them, they all turned their back with their face and they made a circle that they couldn't see their face. Meaning they can take pictures of me, but no one will, not, will ever know in the world. There would not be a picture of me not modest in the world. When they came to the secular, they were so desperate, they already gave up. They stood like this and they took pictures of them. And those are the pictures that they put today in the museum with no shame. So when I say that, right away they made headlines. The famous speaker claimed that the secular women posed nude for the Nazis. The headline. Listen to what I say and look what they wrote. That I say that, they, hey Hans, hey Adolf, before you kill me, can you come take some pictures of me? That's how they made it. This Reshaim Arurim. I say to myself, what do you expect from these evil monsters? They hate the religion so much, they're willing to twist everything. I say, you know what, let me write to them an email. <laughs> Myself. No lawyers, no nothing. I wrote to them what I say and what you say is complete opposite. You have one hour to take it off or you're going to have a lawsuit of millions. Less than a minute it was off. The damage was done already. Thousands of people already saw it. You get the point? This is how they are, these evil people. That's how their agenda is, to destroy us, to destroy the Shivot, to destroy the Torah. And a lot of religious naive people uh, cooperate with this Rishayim. Cooperate with them. It's unbelievable. That's what happens when you don't learn in a good yeshiva, you don't learn by serious good Rabbanim with good Ashkafa. You become half and half. Half and half. Half pure water, half poison. When you give someone a glass full of poison, it's all poison. Oh, half water, half poison. Does it make a difference? But half is pure. Half clean water. But half poison. You get the point or no? That's what happens when you become half and half. It's all poison. It doesn't matter that half religious. A person with a yarmulke on his head scream, leave the yeshivot and go to the army? To do what? To be in the army with the naked soldier female there? To hear the curses of all the secular soldiers all day? To listen to the garbage music with the curses every other word? What to do? To do what? That I won't be able to pray? There won't be two minutes to put fill in? We won't be able to say Shema Israel on the right time. You won't be able to see a book a minute, a month. The, the army is kosher. The army has any respect to the, the Torah. Don't be blind by the war right now. When the, when the gun is to the head, all of a sudden everyone is religious. This is because of the tragedy. But now they're going back to the normal. For three months, it was quiet. Why? Everyone was still shocked. 
Right now they full force back to their evil way. Destroy the yeshivot, this, that, non-stop. Why? If you see the comments that they write against rabbis, today they published the government wants to pass the law that they committed to the religious people that they're going to make 1,000 new neighborhood rabbis in Israel. It's a big shortage of rabbis. I want to ask you a question. Each neighborhood rabbi is in charge of how many people? Do you know? According to the Israeli law. Every rabbi, they give him a salary to be a neighborhood rabbi. How many people per rabbi? For every how many Israelis, they nominate one rabbi. Who knows? Give me a number. Today you have a shul. Let's say you have a shul in a Syrian community. A thousand people, right? Big shul, nice, thousand people. One rabbi cannot take control of a thousand people. He needs three, four assistants. Youth minyan rabbi, another minyan, another assistant rabbi. Guess in Israel, one rabbi for how many people? 50,000 Israelis for one rabbi. Now you may say, yeah, but from the 50,000, 40,000 are not religious. So only 10,000 care about the rabbi. The other one eats shrimps on Yom Kippur, they don't care. Not true. When they die, they call the rabbi. When their father died, they need to see Shiva, they call the rabbi. When someone is sick in hospital dying, they call the rabbi. They are double faced. When everything is good, they smash the religion. When they have a problem, they remember that there's a rabbi. And rabbi, rabbi, my father is dying. What should we do? <laughs> the rabbi of the neighborhood will have to give them service. You have to see how they were cursing the religion today. Thousands of comments. Now one of them was for the rabbis. All parasites, crooks, corrupted, we're tired of paying you, it's fake jobs, what do we need you for? One person wrote, you bunch of hypocrite losers, when you're going to die, you're gonna run quickly to those rabbis. Now you are a hero. When your father is gonna die tomorrow, who are you gonna run to? You don't want rabbis, who are you gonna run to? Who's gonna bury him? Who's gonna arrange the shiva? Who is going to arrange the future funeral? Who is going to arrange the, the, the old side? Who is going to take care of the shloshim? Who is going to take care of everything? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Don't look for logic. As long as they hear something religious, they become mamash, such monsters, it's hard to believe. Then they ask, where was God in October 7th? Do you even want to answer that? Where was Hashem in the Holocaust? Read the book of Rav Avigdor Miller. It'll tell you what happened before the Holocaust in Europe. He was there. He saw they go on a bus on Shabbat to work. Thousands of Jews standing in a bus stops all over, going to, to work on Shabbat. Then when there was a Holocaust, people started to say, where was God in the Holocaust? What does the Torah say? Mechalel Shabbat Mot Yumat will be put to death in this world and in the next world. It's a verse in the Torah 12 times it appears. Now when what the Torah warned from happening, you come and ask why? If it wouldn't be written in the Torah, of course you have the right to ask why. But if it's written in advance, that that's going to be your end. If you go to your doctor and your doctor tell you if you eat this food, in three months you'll die. You're allergic. You know, Kurdish, they cannot eat lima bean. Full. Some Kurdish, if they eat it, one time they die. Lima bean, those big beans. I had one guest in my house, he was about to, is this lima bean, is it full? So yeah. <laughs> if I eat it now, I'm, I'll die on the spot. Allergic to it. So if you go to the doctor, I knew one time I had an assistant many years ago, he was allergic to eggs. Allergic to eggs. Everything he had to check 10 times, because you know, there's a lot of eggs in a product. White, this, that, yellow. 
One time he didn't realize they gave him eggs, his face became the size of a huge watermelon. Got so scared, Woo, like this. It looks like a life risk. You have to run to the hospital, they give them something, antidote, I don't know what. So if the doctor said to a person, if you eat this for three months, for sure you die. Maximum three months. And he eats. Then he's dying. Why am I dying? It's not fair. Why am I dying? How can you not die? We told you in advance that you're going to die. What is the question for? The answer is the questions come from the heart, not from the brain. The brain knows why he's dying. He knows. He heard it hundreds of times in speeches, in, in, in lectures. He read books. Some of them were in yeshiva when they were young. They know. But it, come, it comes from the heart. Why me and not others? That's really the question. Everyone is Mechalel Shabbat, so why I die? Why only 1,200 die in October 7? They ask. You're not, you're not, no rabbi in Israel, not one, not one dare to talk about that party with the Buddha that he was on Simchat Torah on Shabbat. They were all afraid. They're going to kill you. I hate you as it is. Well, you're going to say the truth in their face? Even my mother called me, I'm begging you, please don't talk about that party. Why? People here are not in the mood to hear Musar now. What are you going to say? Mechalel Shabbat Mot Yumat? They heard it many times. What are you going to, after it happened to them, you're going to say to them, to them, you went against the Torah, and the Torah warned from all these things. What's the point of even talking? It's anyway not going to help. They get angry, and a month later, they go back to their normal life. They're not going to go, they're not going to change. If you don't want to be tzaddik, nothing will help. Nothing will help. There's a boy who stopped to put tzitzit. Someone sent me a video of an Israeli guy without a shirt on his chest by the heart on the left side. He's facing the camera so it looks on the right, but it's really on the left side. Mamash by the heart. Maybe six inches of cut. They saw that. And he said, I had a huge miracle, I have to share it with you. Look what happened to me. He showed the, the saw, the electric saw. He lost control, it flew while he was working. <laughs> Cut him in the heart! And then the saw stopped. Stopped to work, and it fell. But it stopped to work. Then later after the hospital, he was thinking to himself, I don't understand, what made it stop? It was supposed to continue to work and cut me to two halves. Cut my entire stomach to the, to the spine. He went back home from the hospital and he saw the sore. What, what got stuck in the sore? His tzitzit. The tzitzit got stuck in a blade and stopped it. I sent that video to that boy. What was his reaction? Can you believe it? He shows you the saw with the tzitzit stuck, the string of the tzitzit stuck in a blade. And you know how it is. Once it gets stuck, it stops the blade. You believe it? <laughs> Why the boy say you believe it? He believes it. You know it's real, the video. I won't make a fool out of him looking, talking to the camera, and publishing it all over Israel. Why the boy say you believe it? He doesn't want to change. He doesn't want to change. So he lies. You can believe that. It's fake. What's, what's the answer you're supposed to give him? Believe it or not, it's not relevant. The Torah says you have to put tzitzit. <laughs> With accident, without accident. Tzitzit. Every second is mitzvah tzitzit. What do you lose? Put it under your clothes. Every second mitzvah. Even at night you get mitzvah. Even though you're not obligated at night to put tzitzit. Every second mitzvah. Do you found any easier mitzvah besides mezuzah? That's the second easiest mitzvah in the Torah. Second easiest. Why? Why second easiest? Mezuzah, you put in the door, you don't sweat, it's not hot, it's not, uh, you know, in the summertime. 
It's not, sometimes it's not convenient, it could be itchy, I don't know. So mezuzah every second is mitzvah, it's kosher. You know, so you get one, two, three, doing nothing. One time you pay, you put the mezuzah, every second you get a mitzvah. Huge income. For that, you should thank God for giving you a big mansion. If you live in a big mansion. There is no reason to live in a big mansion besides two. One is to have a lot of mezuzot. And second, to have a lot of guests and shiure Torah. To make it a place of hospitality. If you don't do both, better you live in a shed. Live in your car. If you have a big mansion and you put cheap mezuzot because you're stingy, you spend eight million dollars to build a home and then you go and, don't you have something cheaper? Yes, yeah, smaller. Some people, they first buy Judaica boxes. Rabbi, you have a size 10 centimeter? 10 centimeter. You can barely see it. The whole line is one word. There's no room for spaces. Yeah, but our in-laws got us boxes from the Judaica store in Manhattan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I said, first you choose the cloth, the mezuzah. After you choose the best one, then you measure what's the size of it, and you, the box is not relevant. Wood box, plastic box, gold box, that doesn't add to the mitzvah anything. Nothing. You don't get any reward for the box. So you can put a plastic box, even plastic box, in a Judaica store costs $14. A nice one. <laughs> Nothing is cheap anymore. So tzitzit is the second easiest mitzvah. You wear it under the clothes, every second mitzvah, and also protects life. You know how many people got saved from, that, from death because of the tzitzit? Thousands of stories online you have. Saves lives. Even Goim asked me, can I also put tzitzit? Goim heard my lecture about filin and mezuzot here, I think it was last week or two weeks ago. I spoke about it, remember? You know how many Goim ask? I'm not a Jew, can I also put mezuzot in my house? I want the best ones. He <laughs> doesn't have Yetzirah. Once you're not obligated in the mitzvah, you don't have Yetzirah. You only have Yetzirah, big one, when you are obligated. When you are not obligated, it's much easier for you to do. That's why these Goim are fanatic in religion before they convert. Once they convert, their donations go 90% lower. They became Jewish. <laughs> Before, it was very generous. Rabbi, I heard you can get donations on Bitcoin. That was before he became a Jew. Once he became a Jew, no more Bitcoin. <laughs> Why? Now it is Yetzirah. The Yetzirah, the evil inclination, constantly fight from within. Don't be stupid. Why are you spreading your money? There's other things to do with your money. You're gonna need it in 20 years for your children's wedding. Remember what the Rambam say. Asechel huashamash laratzon. The brain, your intelligence, your wisdom is a servant of your will, meaning of your desire. You first want to do something, right or wrong, you don't care. I want to do it, but it's not allowed. It's allowed, you fanatic. Santa Claus says it's allowed. He has a knight's beard, much longer than yours. I heard he's selling now sleeveless t-shirts for women online. Someone sent me today, I couldn't believe it. I thought maybe it's a scam. I asked the, the, the girl that sent it, how do you know it's him? She sent me the actual page. These shirts are not allowed for Jewish women to, to wear such shirts. It's completely against the halacha. Machti Rabim, literally. You sell women all kinds of Purim things. Logos, Esther, Vashti, I don't know, all kinds of things, Haman. But no, 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 no sleeves, sleeveless shirts. 
women will buy this and wear it on the streets in public to show the logos. Every second is machtiyat arabim. But he doesn't care. He says women have to show their beauty to the street. Once you're upside down, everything by you is upside down. Remember, we spoke about it last week in Brooklyn. Once you see a person is capable of being such spiritual monster, that's it. Can I rely on them on anything, anything whatsoever? Can I ask him a simple halacha question? Nothing. Why? Because you, you see that these people have no irat shamayim. That's what the Gemara says. The Gemara says, Kol shirato kodemet lechokhmato, chokhmato mitkayemet. כל שחוכמתו קודמת לירתו, אין חוכמתו מתקיימת. Translation. People have level of God fearing from zero to 100%. What's your level? 40%, 50%, 70%, 80%, 90%? You are a God fearing person. And you have a level of wisdom in Torah from zero to 100. So let's say if Rav Eliashiv in this generation was 100, other rabbis can be 70, 65, 60, okay. There's a level of wisdom. Depend on how smart your brain is and how many years you sit and learn seriously. The more you learn, the smarter you be. It's a, it's a, it's a game of numbers. However, if you just educated in Torah because you learn in university in Manhattan, but your Irat Shamayim is zero, Zero. You pro gays, you go and take pictures with them in a parade, you, you sell shirts like this online, you tell women, go show your beauty in the public to make Hashem angry, and you make up all kinds of heretic comments. You have zero irat shamayim, you have zero fear from God. You do whatever you want. You don't care about anybody anyway, you make fun at people who rebuke you. Rabbi Reuven called him, wanted to talk to him in a respectful way. He said, yeah, they have to pay me $400 to agree to talk to them on the phone. $400 to talk to him on the phone. King Achashverosh wants $400 to talk to him on the phone. So once a person has knowledge, but zero irat shamayim, his knowledge is worthless, the Gemara said. Once a person has a big irat shamayim, even smaller knowledge, but big irat shamayim, his knowledge is blessed. Because Hashem helped him to aim to the truth. That's why Halakha is always like Bet Hillel. Shammai was great, just as great in Torah. Hillel and Shammai. Shammai was huge in Torah, just as much as Hillel. But Halakha is almost always like Hillel, automatically. Don't have to investigate. Alakha kebet Hillel. Why? Because he was more humbled. The question is, what humble has to do with knowledge? If you have a humbled person that is a complete ignorant, and then you have a proud person that has a lot of knowledge, learned 20 years in yeshiva, the, who can answer your question? The ignorant humble or the genius arrogant person? The arrogant person knows to answer. But when you have an arrogant against an humble and they both have the same knowledge, of course you don't look at the arrogant at all. You don't care what he say. You only care what the humble say. The question is why? The arrogant cannot be right sometimes? The answer, yes, he can. But we don't care about it. We will automatically put all our money on the humble one. Why? Because Hashem loves the humble and hate those who are not humble. Therefore, if Hashem loves one more than the other, He will help him more to aim to the truth. That's why we put all our money on him. Don't get me wrong, Shammai Chas Shalom wasn't arrogant, he was a huge tzaddik. And he was a little bit less humble than, the, than Hillel, the Gemara said. Compared to us, yes, <laughs> a holy, uh, beyond words. But compared to Hillel, which was so humble, like Moshe Rabbeinu almost, Hillel was very, very down to earth. That's why Hashem helps him to aim to the truth of Hashem. Because remember, in Halacha, it's like an ocean. This source, that source, this one contradict that, this one, this one answer, this one ask, this one. It's like a puzzle. In the end, one detail you didn't understand correctly or you missed, the, the bottom line 
can be wrong. Say in the end, it's allowed. But Hashem thing, it's not allowed. Or you say it's not allowed and Hashem thinks it's allowed. What caused you in the end to, to answer the wrong answer? One tiny detail. Why did it happen to you? Because you're not humble enough. You're not humble enough. What does it have to do with the truth? When someone has good traits, and he's surrendered to Hashem and he knows he's nothing, meaning he's humble, Hashem open up his eyes to always see the truth. Saves him from ruling the wrong answer. That's what happened with Rav Moshe Feinstein Zatzal. He was the most humble rabbi, the most humble, the huge genius, Talmid Chacham, Tzadik Esod Olam, Rav Moshe Feinstein. And a woman came after the Vietnam War to his bed din, Rabbi, you allow me to get remarried based on testimonies that my husband died in Vietnam and he just came back and I'm already remarried with children. And Rav Moshe Feinstein was sitting in a bed in, in Manhattan, Lower East Side. And he, he looked at the woman and he said, I never gave you this letter. She said, Rabbi, it's your letter with your signature with the stamp of this bed in. And he said, no, I never gave you this letter. And his grandson, Rabbi Tendler, was his shamash. He is the one who told the story. And she, and she, she insisted, what do you mean you didn't give it to me? It's your signature, it's your bed in, it's your signature, it's everything, you know. So he told her for the fourth time, I never gave you this letter. I never gave it to you. After all this back and forth, she started to cry. You're right, Rabbi, you never gave me this letter, it's forged. You forged a letter, you went and got remarried, your children are mamzerim, what, what do you want from me? When she left, his grandson asked him, Grandpa, hundreds of people come to you every week to the bed din, for years. This was something years ago. She already got married and have children, it's probably at least five, six years. How do you remember in Negev? She stand with such confidence and tell you it's your signature and your stamp and the letter from your bed in. He said to him, it cannot be that Hashem will do such a thing to me. Absolutely not possible. That I'm going to give a letter to a married woman that she's permitted to get remarried. I gave my life for the Torah for Hashem and I'm not doing it not for honor and not for money and it's big burden for me all day to serve the public. Why would Hashem do it to me? What for? That I lose my credit after all my life learning Torah to help the public? That's it, my name will be burned. No one will ever come to see me, no one will care about what I say, they're gonna burn my books. If this true, if this story Chas Shalom would really happen, that he actually gave her that letter, I'm sure we, all his the Hasidim, he would burn his books right away after that. Cannot rely on someone like this. Allow a married woman to get remarried. <laughs> what a tragedy is this. But he already knew Hashem is not going to do it for him. He's not going to do it. Why? Because Hashem's interest is that he's going to continue to do what he did. The holy work. Save the public. Help the public. Bezrat Hashem, I will finish the Purim uh, lecture tomorrow in Brooklyn, and if I don't, Wednesday I also have a lecture here by Rabbi Dill. I think it's in Holly Seals. Wednesday there's a lecture here. You, you're invited if you want to come. I think it, uh, we put it on the calendar on my website and on the app. 8 p.m. on Wednesday, here in Queens. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Rabbi Hanania ben Akashia Omer, Atzah, Gadosh Baruch Hu Lezakot.